This is Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about The Eternals, the 26th movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Eternals Assemble. Welcome back, fellow defenders, to Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We've been back to the cinema to watch Eternals, the 26th movie in the MCU. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow defenders. I'm one of your other hosts, John. And hello, Deviants, Eternals, and mere mortals. I am Chris. Excellent. I like that you didn't uh, classify uh, one or other of those as our wonderful uh, fellow defenders. No, uh, you could be any. Any of them could be defensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here to chat about Eternals, yes. Uh, doing it a bit uh, out of order here. We mentioned before that uh, we will be covering Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings when it comes out on Disney+. Plus. Uh, it's coming out on the 12th of November. That is the 25th movie in the MCU and The Eternals is the 26th movie. But we're doing them the wrong way around because Eternals came out in the cinema uh, on the 5th of, uh, of November, the week before uh, Shang-Chi comes out on Disney+. Plus. So uh, kind of weird that we're doing them the wrong way around. Um, but we will be talking about Shang-Chi. I promise we'll get to it. Yes, we will. Yes. Yes, definitely. Two very different movies. Two very different movies, but we just had a lot on. We've just finished covering uh, Why the Last Man, the 10-episode series on uh, on Hulu, uh, and just finished covering uh, What If, Marvel's uh, animated TV show. So loads going on in October, and unfortunately, with everything that was going on in the world, uh, we couldn't all get out at the same time to see Shang-Chi in the cinema. So, uh, so we will be back with that, but we do want to talk in depth about, uh, about the Eternals. So we've all got to the cinema. Did we all go and see it in IMAX? So John went to see it in the IMAX. Chris, did you get to see it in the IMAX? I saw it in Max, which is kind of faux IMAX, but with um, Dolby Atmos. Okay. Kind of, uh, so it's the more, it's the Dolby Vision aspect. And yeah. the so it's a smaller screen, but same sound. Better sound, yeah. Because it's uh, but it's a slightly smaller screen. Yeah. Oh my goodness, you missed that crucial bit in the corner. Probably, I think it we. Is that, yeah. It's that slight. It's like, what was that up there in the th- up, upper right corner? No, it doesn't matter. Bye. Like the IMAX screen is so big, and we were we were kind of at that point in the rows where it was like, are we too close? Where it's kind of like playing tennis during the full thing because you've got to move your head around to see all parts of the screen. Uh, yeah, it was a little um, just on the border of being able to take the whole screen in in one field of view. Well, the movie opens with a picture of the sun on the right-hand side of the screen. It takes up the entirety of the right-hand side of the screen. And, you just, and we were sitting on the right-hand side of the of the, uh, of the the cinema itself looking at the sun, and then suddenly you kind of go, oh, sure, there's something going on on the left-hand side. There's a, yeah. there's a ship arriving uh, <laughs> on the left-hand side, so you kind of have to move your head to watch it. I love that, though. It's a, I it's actually a really got a uh, suntan as well. Yes. <laughs> it's so real. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, fellow defenders. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, you could subscribe to it by going to tvpodcastindustries.com or anywhere that you uh, subscribe to podcasts. You could just search TV Podcast Industries and uh, and find the podcast and, and keep up with all the stuff that we're covering. Uh, if you want to send any feedback to us about any of the movies or TV shows that we cover, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can join us over in our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TV Podcast Industries where we have loads of spoiler posts for all the things we're discussing as well. So you can uh, discuss with us and chat about uh, all the spoilery thoughts you may have on the movies and TV shows we cover. I think that's it. Ready to go into our discussion about it. Eternals, yeah? Nope. It's much like the film. Let's wait aeons to get to the main story. Chris may be sharing his thoughts about uh, Eternals. <laughs> oh my there. goodness. <laughs> Spoilers. But I think we will be getting into our spoiler-filled discussion. Yes. Derek, what are some of the production details? Well, the movie directed by Chloe Zhao, director of Oscar-winning movie Nomadland. She is also one of the writers on the screenplay. She wrote it alongside Patrick Burlow. And the screen story was written by Chloe Zhao, Kaz, and Ryan Frippo. The cast for this movie is massive, including Angelina Jolie as Tina, Kit Harrington as Black Knight, Richard Mann as Icarus, Gemma Chan as Cersei, Selma Hayek as Ajak, Don Lee as Gilgamesh, Kumail Nanjiani as uh, Kingo, Barry Keoghan as Droog, Liam McHugh as Sprite, Brian Tyree Henry as Fastos, and Lauren Ridloff as Makari. John, do you want to tell us what everybody in this team gave us with your synopsis for Eternals? Sure. In 5000 BC, a group of eternal warriors, Ajax, Icarus, Circe, Sprite, Thena, Druig, 
Gilgamesh, Kingo, Makari, and Fastos were sent to Earth by the celestial being Arisham. Their mission is to protect humans from violent deviants, but not to interfere with human progress. Over millennia, they fight this battle and eventually establish a stronghold where they live together in Babylon. Two of the Eternals, Icarus and Circe, fall in love and marry. By 1521, at Tinosh Tichlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, the Eternals finally defeated the last deviant on Earth. In the aftermath of this victory, Thena is afflicted with Madweary, a disease that releases the memories of all her previous lives. She cannot control her power and attacks the Eternals. Gilgamesh calms Thena and agrees to watch over her instead of wiping her mind. With their mission seemingly complete, their leader Ajax releases the rest from their obligations to go out into the world and live lives until Arisham calls upon them. But Druig, who has the power of mind control, is angry that he's not allowed to use these powers to prevent conflict between humans and separates from all the rest. In present-day London, Cersei and eternal teenager Sprite are attacked by a new, more powerful deviant. With the help of Icarus, they drive away the monster and set out to find their leader, Ajax, who has been murdered by the deviant. As Cersei stays by Ajax's side, a golden orb passes from Ajax to her, as she is chosen as the new leader of the Eternals. She contacts Arishim, where Cersei learns the truth. They were to encourage life on Earth until there was enough to awaken a new celestial, Tiamut. The return of all humans after Thanos' snap has tipped the balance, and Cersei needs to reunite the Eternals before the planet they love is destroyed. And that, fellow defenders, is my trip down memory lane of 7,000 years. Woohoo! <laughs> and I think that's probably going to be the first 40 minutes of the movie. Right? Exactly, well, um, yeah. So lots going on in here, lots of brand new characters, lots of uh, lots of brand new words uh, being introduced uh, within this within this world. And one of the longest uh, Marvel movies that we've seen in, in the last uh, couple of years as well. Yep. I think Endgame is still the longest Marvel movie that's been released, but this is, uh, this is quite long. Uh, we've been getting our money's worth going to the cinema the last couple of months. We want to see Bond, which is two hours and 45 minutes let's see dune which is around the same length and now we've got eternals so uh, they're definitely giving you money's worth when you go to the cinema aren't they? yeah and then spider-man's is reportedly the same the Report- longest ever spider-man event. movie that's right yeah. Yes, yeah that's the river do you want to just quickly kick us off with a general idea of the perspective you're coming from what do you, how, how do you think of the movie what do you think of the movie chris you kind of already intimated uh, your thoughts about the movie but just a quick line to sum up what you think of the movie to begin with before we get into our discussion quick sentence is Good, not great, strange choices. Um, interested to see where it goes. How does that sound? Okay, okay, John, how about yourself? Uh, I came out kind of enjoying I, I, the the whole thing. I think this has got a lot to do. I think it's probably a unique Marvel movie in terms of what it needs to do and the subject that it's talking about, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I came out kind of feeling like I really like that. I'm not saying it's my favourite Marvel, but it's something different, and I think because of that, it's probably going to sit across a various spectrum of thoughts by most people that are invested in the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's, uh, yeah, overall, I thought it was pretty uh, pretty good. Derek, what about yourself? I came out not sure whether I liked the movie or not, um, but having sat with it for a few days, I actually think this is a pretty contemplative movie. I think the the storyline of it is really complex and everything that's going on in, in the movie takes a bit of time to think about and kind of get your head around. But I came out unsure of how I felt about it. Uh, but after thinking about it for a few days, putting together the notes and, and kind of getting a, a, a full idea of what the whole storyline is trying to accomplish, I think they did a really good job with this movie. This is something that I'm really looking forward to going to see again in the movie. There was a great spectacle to it. It's a good epic film. And as you say, yeah. John, it's trying to accomplish a lot with a storyline with all brand new characters. There's none of these characters that were mentioned before in other movies. And, you know, even the things that connect to the universe that we've seen before are quite complex uh, in in their explanations. It's not a simple explanation, for example, why they didn't interfere when Thanos attacked the planet. It's not a simple explanation. We have that dealt with over the course of the film. You know, that kind of stuff I thought was really interesting. So uh, so overall, yeah, really liked it. Uh, They've accomplished a lot with the movie and, and very intrigued to see how they incorporate these characters in the future. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Let's get into our main points there to talk about in the movie. And I've um, 
I've kicked off our first point as Eternals Through History, which is about six and a half thousand years, I think, if my if my maths is correct. They arrive 5,000 uh, BC, and I think the battle, uh, which kind of ends that first period, is 1500, 1521. So that's uh, 6,500 years. So can we cover that in one point, guys? I guess so. Sure, I guess we'll we can at least to. attempt. Yeah. In the beginning, there was man. <laughs> well, actually, no, Chris. before that, in the beginning, in the beginning there was. There was, there was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the story of the Eternals is that they're sent to Earth by a being called Arisham to protect humans from deviants which are rising on the planet in 5000 BC. So that's kind of our first moment where we see them arrive on the planet. Uh, we do find out later that story is uh, not exactly accurate, but this is the belief that they have when they're coming to the planet. And really interesting opening scene where we have um, this, oh, this ancient Mesopotamian society uh, fishing on the beaches and then suddenly we see an attack from the deviants taking out yeah. uh, a human on the beach. Instantly, I, w- I realized we were in a, a bit more of an adult uh, Marvel movie straight away. We have someone getting eaten alive in the opening couple of seconds of this movie. Uh, I thought that was quite, yeah. a, quite a surprise. It looked quite brutal. I know we've had brutal moments in Marvel movies, but it felt really uh, instantly brutal at the, spe- at the beginning of this. But he gets his whole head taken off. Like... Pretty quickly, and it's a dad, and you see the kid kind of going, Fada! Fada! Um, yes, and then it was beyond that, it was the, the, the instant we're in to a fight. Yeah. Which is unique. And not, well, I say it's unique. It felt unique. It probably isn't. Probably they're actually thinking about it. Age of Ultron did it. Which I was, was thinking exactly was, the same. Literally, yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, wait, it's Age of Ultron, where you get to see everyone gets their own couple of seconds, then you get to see the team as a whole. Um and I, I enjoyed this. You get to see every you get to see all the 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 fighters together and then all the thinkers come down to and the everyone it's a basically it was an interesting way to show everyone's powers. Absolutely, Chris, totally agree with you. Having having these ten new characters being introduced to the universe, what a great way to kick them off and have a moment where each of them uh, shows you what their powers are. You know, we have uh, we have Superman uh, b- beginning so with with Icarus arriving, um, and obviously Theta coming in directly afterwards, looking like Wonder Woman. That my instant thought was, "Hey, look, Marvel's doing a DC movie, and they're showing you how it should be done." <laughs> so yeah. it was like, it was instantly in, everybody battles together, and they're all on the same side working together. Uh, really intrigued to see Kingo um, come in, a character p- played by uh, Camille Nanjani, who's uh, who's showing that he has finger guns back in the uh, yeah. 5,000 BC. That was really fun. And then, as you say, Chris, having the, all the thinkers, having, you know, um, McCurry coming in and taking everybody out of harm's way, all the all the humans out of harm's way with their super speed, and then having Fastos come in and, and show his, uh, his abilities with technology, then having Drew calm everybody down using his mind control, you know, so you see all of these different aspects of, of this full team. Uh, one other thing I really liked was when they were all brought to life effectively aboard the ship and all given their given their uh, their uh, uniforms effectively. I like how they step forward, look at Earth, and look at each other and go, "Hi, my name is Icarus." So they're brand new, effectively reborn as they're coming to this yeah. world. I think that's a, that was a lovely touch right at the start. That kind of plays out a little bit later on when you realize that this they've all had their mind wiped after the last time they had a mission like this. I thought that was kind of yeah. interesting to see. Yeah, and it, it it's that first contact as well, isn't it? It it, it goes and or delves into that um, that that tradition of the idea of aliens coming to Earth to imbue yes. knowledge. Um, yeah. So is it Graham Hancock or, or one Eric you know, von Danigan? Yeah, there's a there's a number of authors of the um, and mm. uh, all, all about sort of like with the um, pyramids of Egypt yep. and, and so on and so forth, all this different the theories. Um, so that was kind of interesting because, I mean, ultimately that is the, you know, this is very much, I guess, to some degree, this is almost the, the creation element um, within the Marvel Universe mm-hmm. uh, to some degree. Um, and uh, so I, I thought that was really cool. I loved how they arrived. I loved that shot of them all silhouetted against the sky with Icarus kind of 
floating down in between them and um, very superman like uh, and of course quite a few references to the uh the rival comics uh with batman yeah. and alfred as well as uh superman which i thought was quite interesting and um, i guess there's a i mean i think it's when makari there's one point where she is speeding uh through the world uh, and there's a uh, a very flash type moment uh, there where she's sort of bounding across yeah. uh, the planet surface. So, um, yeah. You, you get all really the DC characters in this. You yep. really well, do. You get, you get thematic references or direct references yeah. to all the DC <laughs> Definitely. It is majors. the direct references as well. You know, the, the, the fact that we've been covering, you know, Marvel stuff for six years now on, on our podcast. You know, I remember back in the day on Netflix, you know, and you kind of go, oh, they're watching 24 on TV. Oh, 24 is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And now, you know, 10 years into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they're referencing Batman, Superman, Clark Kent, Alpha Pennyworth. You know, they're actually saying their names out loud in a Marvel script. That feels really unusual. They're effectively yeah. really setting setting it in uh, in our world. Yeah, even the first contact element, I guess, with Superman coming from an alien world. Yeah. And um, so, like, but I, I, yeah, I, I love the little battle at the start, seeing kind of bits and bobs of everyone's uh, powers, and um, and and ultimately this arrival uh, on the coastline in the Middle East, uh, Mesopotamia, that. Mm-hmm. You know, that notion, uh, as it's known as the, the breadbasket of the world in terms of war and the cradle of life, where all these uh, innovations um, that kick-started, um, I guess, human and um, technological evolution mm. um, sort of stem from. Um, even e- even just that moment with um, uh, in, in Babylon uh, and the Hanging Gardens mm. were... It's almost like uh, I think uh, C- Cersei is is showing how to uh, make bread um, with the grain. That idea of you know something like bread and n- knowing that yeast can prove and and leaven it and, and all this kind of stuff. So this was all really kind of um, yeah. Right in my wheelhouse. Absolutely. John's obsession with Great British Bake Off coming back for the second podcast in a week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I saw a cameo from uh, Paul Hollywood and Mary Berry there. Uh, I don't think Prue was there, though. I think, yeah, there was an old lady there. It must have been Mary Berry. <laughs> must have been Mary Berry. I love it. Um, but yes, I, I, speaking of technology, you know, I, lo- I love that moment where it kind of comes back to uh, Fastos, who is the technolo- technological genius who's kind of going, well, we could give them this here. It's like a steam engine. <laughs> Uh, for them to do their, their farm work, and they're going. Oh no! Hang on a second. A bit too, a bit too much, too soon. Yeah. Uh, so he turns it back into a, a like, standard plow. I've got a plow. Yeah. There you go. A bit, um, a bit of wood with a sharp edge. Yeah. But I can't. I, I love all these character moments. This is really early on. You know, we're just going through that first initial setup, and everybody seems to have interesting character moments, which will play off in various ways throughout the movie. Um, but I do like that they ha- they all have moments. It doesn't feel like there's a central character that we're following to begin no. with. Even with having someone as famous as Salma Hayek playing the role of Ajak as this as the leader of the team, you would expect her to be much more central. But everybody seems to be given their moment uh, in this opening half hour of the film. Yes, everyone's given their moment. I think the main character is Gemma Chan Cersei. I think that is... Yeah. I think she is the focal. She is the cat. She is the movie and the audience's center point. Yes. She is going to be, I believe, the much like she was the Avenger in the comic books. And she was the, the, a lot of the comic book readers introduction to what the Eternals are and who they are, etc. Um, I believe that's what she will be going forward. Interesting. Yeah, she's she's definitely the 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 audience's point of reference here. Yes, but I think this is the most ensemble movie that we've gotten. Mm-hmm. Um, in the sense that yes, it does focus on her, but it, it's kind of like the Avengers before they all got their individual. You know, they didn't get their individual movies beforehand. Uh, ultimately, yes. this is them assembling um on the spaceship and off doing their collective thing and um, and and the the you know the crazy thing about it though is that it's not a specific thing that's happening this is like an epic across time at least seven thousand years of human history and uh, their own interactions and a, a bit like before also having to address you know why they didn't 
prevent Thanos mm-hmm. and, and and all that. So like I think this movie has a, a lot to do and I I actually think it succeeds in it really. It it's introducing a whole new side of the Marvel universe yeah. with the Celestials, the Eternals, um that the I guess took, you know, if you, you think of Guardians of the Galaxy or the space side of Marvel with Thanos being introduced, um, uh, uh, in Avengers in the end credits, you know, there's a lot of movies that are leading up to, um, Endgame and, um, the Infinity Gauntlet sort of the, you know, those last two big movies in, mm-hmm. in the Marvel. This is like, this is dumped on us. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's not been any, um, you know, post credit hint at Eternals, mm-hmm. the Celestials, um, other than the, the trailers ultimately. So this is a, look, here's a whole side that we haven't mentioned before. Yeah. I mean, even with Doctor Strange in terms of introducing the magic, that now is, you know, through Thor and through Spider-Man and Endgame and so on. There's been, you know, a number of moments to sort of acclimatize people to that in the MCU, even though, you know, at least for all people that are coming to Marvel from the movies, um, and which we've been talking about the multiverse, how there's all this warm up mm-hmm. with WandaVision and with Loki and with No Way Home, the upcoming Spider Man, to kind of acclimatize the audience to multiverses. So this is like completely different to that. It's like, here you go. Is this whole new thing that includes Celestials, Eternals, um, uh, you know, does this include Galactus? Does this include cosmic entities like Eternity or the Living Tribune? You know, it's kind of like where, where do they all fit in? But yep. it's basically the focus on Celestials and Eternals. Yeah, absolutely. And the entirety of human history. <laughs> and the entirety yes. of human history and their own in- interactions between the Eternals and their interaction with humans mm. yeah. and their view of the planet and the human race and trying to say, yeah. this is why we didn't stop Thanos yeah. or Thanos. <laughs> and and the argument from Chloe Zhao and uh, Kaz and Ryan Firpa, who who wrote the central story for Eternals is that audiences are now becoming so knowledgeable within um, within comic book stories that they didn't want to present the simple bang, bang, pow, pow superhero comic book movie that people expect to see. And that's one thing I will absolutely compliment Kevin Feige's version of the MCU now going into phase four. They are making more complex films and it feels like they're willing to go this doesn't have to be for all the audiences. These are movies that can be made for some audiences. Some people will really enjoy this. Some people may not like it, but it doesn't matter. They, they're they yeah. at that point where yeah. they don't really mind anymore. Of course, they want to make money. <laughs> don't get me wrong. And they probably limited the budget on something like this to go, this won't make $2 billion like Avengers Endgame made. It may make $700 million, which is a significant profit on the budget that they threw into it. But they don't care. They don't need every person in the world to go out to the cinema. They'd love it. But it feels like they're making movies for different audiences now under the Marvel Studios structure. And this feels very different for that reason. I agree. Yeah, I'd, I'd I, agree. Definitely. I definitely agree. Uh, you know, it is the origin story of, mm-hmm. of the, I guess, the, the, the massively powerful deities of, of the Marvel uni- yeah. universe uh, yeah. in, in the Celestials yeah. and, and you did say this is Eternals Assemble, but this movie <laughs> does kind of move into moving into our second point. It is the breakup. It is it, it is the Eternals disassembling. Yeah. Um. When we get to that that battle in Mexico, um, when we get to that final deviant has been found of the planet, they go to uh, Tenochtitlan. That wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs> I think that was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I I had to really kind of um focus on how to pronounce the the you know the the capital of the aztec world mm. um i guess what well, you could call it mexico city it's present day mexico city but um yeah Do you want to give its real name from from aztec times from from the 1500s uh, you want to give it its real name because it is the the big battle there that ends that society effectively um and i like that they layer in this extra complication we have thena played by angelina jolie uh, losing control of her mind effectively she's um 
she's been afflicted by, by a disease which they call Mad Weary, where effectively her mind breaks and all of her previous iterations, all the other planets that sh- that these Eternals have gone to and carried out their plan are all converging together in her mind and she can't keep them all straight. So she turns on the Eternals and fights against them. This is an, a really interesting complication to bring into to the movie because I didn't expect that. I thought the Eternals were created to come to Earth to carry out a mission. I didn't realize they'd done this on multiple planets. And while they say they're Eternals, they don't just mean they go on forever from the point they arrive to Earth. They have been also going on forever since before they arrived to Earth. Yeah, but within the story, the, this this breakup after the um, after the battle at Tenochtitlan, um, there yeah, is. Done. I think that's how you pronounce it, but um, it, 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 it's we don't know that about Mad Weary. It, it's an affliction that's come on her, and they know about this, but they don't realize how it connects to Arisham and, and actually their true purpose, mm-hmm. at least um, for most of the Eternals there. And I think that's the interesting thing, this breakup is not only because of the Mad Weary uh, suffered from um, Thena, and you have Gilgamesh who will then stay with her to keep it under control and is able to sort of deal with her outbursts because Thena is a hugely powerful warrior, it's a warrior class of the Eternals along with Icarus and Gilgamesh. And, but we also have, you know, other elements of a breakup here with Druig, uh, played by Barry Keoghan. Um, and we also s- very soon after have Icarus leaving um, Cersei uh, as they basically fell in love um, and, and married in, in Babylon. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have a breakup and the, the whole movie starts. So there's all these little breadcrumbs throughout the movie, you know, because we, we have at the start about him leaving her for no explanation so there's that intrigue builds up as to why um has he done that mm-hmm. and ultimately as we move through the 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 film it you know it, it kind of begins to come together but specifically then back on Druig, it's you know this battle um at Tenochtitlan um is the conquistadors effectively uh wiping out the the aztecs mm-hmm. and yep. Um, this is where you see Druig saying, well, I could stop this genocide in an instant. Um, and it, it, it really is, you, you see the connections being made by different uh, Eternals to this world that effectively up till now they've lived on for about 6,000 years. Um, yeah. And th- these connections that they've made, we Absolutely. see Cersei has that also, that, that, that kind of, deep love of the people of this planet as yeah. well have to say this moment from barry kogan um when he when he kind of releases the anger that's within him after six thousand years of being told do not interfere with humans and don't control their minds to stop them from fighting that moment when he just releases it and says this this could all be averted we didn't need to have them all die in war um it's such a great performance yeah. um we've just finished covering why the last man and he was the uh, original actor cast in the role of Yarrick uh, in that series. I can't see him in that role now after seeing him as Druig. He's a fantastic actor, but I just couldn't see him doing Yarrick. Yeah. Um, the way that, uh, that Ben Schneitzer did on that show. I think Ben Schneitzer is the perfect Yarrick. I think Barry Kogan plays this character of Druig really well. He's, it's so different from the stuff I've seen him in before. Um, but he, but that moment of emotion that's coming out of him where, as you say, all of the Eternals have made those connections with humans across the time they're on the planet, but his deep sorrow, effectively, that he couldn't prevent all of these deaths, couldn't help all of the humans just to move along and get along, effectively. Yeah, uh, when he has across, the powers to be able to do, do it. it. Yeah, I think it comes across really, really well. Loved it. I really enjoyed this, because you get to see the emotions so much across all of their faces. Mm. As Ajax is like, all right, go. You see Gilgamesh, I'll stay with Dina and I'll look after her throughout the, the ages. Mm-hmm. Um, finding out that Druig kept the Aztecs going for 20 generations and he's maintained and looked after that all the people he took with him mm-hmm. for yeah. 20 generations has led to that camp yeah. and has stayed in the Amazon in that camp with him. So it's amazing to see that. Mm-hmm. Um, that because you think he is the big bad to that's a degree. what I was gonna say. Yeah, it, yeah, it's one of those ones in comic books. Druig is very much the he's got the the 
black goatee looks like the bad guy from the minute you see him and um the power to manipulate minds in itself is generally treated as a negative power so much and i think even before we went into the cinema we, we, we saw the poster with all of the eternals up on up on the poster and john was going well there's barry kogan in his first villain role <laughs> so i love that that it's 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 not a villainous position that he's taking he's just no. going against the mission of the eternals and totally understandable why of course if they're going to be in the planet surrounded by these people they're going to fall in love with them and want to take care of them and want to protect them and don't understand why you're in a battle and you can save them from deviants but you can't stop them from fighting with each other you know yeah and it, it, it's almost not about good and evil it's about the perception of whether you're being perceived as being righteous or unrighteous here but mm-hmm. ultimately i think what it comes down to um because uh like like we discussed um just before the podcast it's that it's that notion that actually it, it's almost like a religion it's it's the, it's the faith that the eternals have in arisham's plan and it's whether you're unquestioning or questioning mm-hmm. about that it, it's the righteous belief to maintain with that plan despite new evidence uh, or whether you're perceived as being unrighteous because you've changed because of your experience and your just the the being embedded in and on the planet Uh, and those experiences over six and a half thousand years has changed and um, then your your viewpoint of it and of course that scales up into a very different thing about the purity of the mission mm-hmm. um when that becomes revealed um later on yeah and so that's the interesting thing this circumvented a few things for me because as you say i i looked at um drew again the posters and was like there we go evil guy slightly aloof standing off arms crossed closed book yeah. you know yeah in black everyone else kind of more more gold and color mm-hmm. um and actually yeah it it it, it circumvents a, a number of those different things yeah. of my my tiny fragile little mind <laughs> i guess and it's more just that he's put out because he can't use his powers to yeah. help people effectively uh, and that's the moment when they all break up and separate and it, it is kind of interesting that you know being having lived six and a half thousand years together most of them don't see each other again really, from that point until present day. Um, it is just Cersei and uh, and her husband, Icarus, that go off and live together for a couple of hundred years more, and then that's it. Uh, that's the end of their relationship. So those two go off together. Uh, Athena being taken care of by um, by Gilgamesh, and they go off and live together, and everybody else seems quite separate. Um, well, Sprite's that. with Ajax. Yeah. Sprite's, Sprite is Sprite with Sprite Ajax. Stays with the leader. Yeah. That's and right. then we also find out that um, McCarry, while by herself, was also off seeing Druig throughout the ages uh, as well. So there, there has been. So what we find, while separate, there a lot of them they've stayed somewhat, mm. somewhat in contact. But having all lived together pretty much as one unit for the six thousand five hundred years they've been on the planet, they are all kind of separated from then on and don't don't come together as a team. Well, it's at that moment the mission that's finished is that all the deviants mm-hmm. that are killing humans have been have been wiped out and um, exactly. as far or as they so can tell they or so they believe exactly yeah because um, that leads on to our kind of central action beat i suppose which is our third point the return of the deviants so yes in present day and i, I don't know why they don't give the date we're we're uh, we're somewhere around 2024 now is that right in the in the marvel cinematic universe because of the five-year time jump in Endgame, it's around 2023, 2024 in the, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think it's 2024 um, going on to 2025. Because the, the well, depending on what month it is, but it looks like winter, so early twenty, late 2024, early 2025. Yeah, so, something something around there, and it is post the return of uh, of all of the all of the humans that were snapped away by uh, by Thanos. Um, but we have Cersei and her new boyfriend, um, Dane Whitman, played by Kit Harrington, uh, in London, going out and having a having a good old session, a good old drinking session in London. Yeah, uh, with Sprite, and we kind of see a little bit of Sprite's character here. Um, Sprite being a teenager since she arrived on the planet, or a very young teenager actually, since she arrived on the planet, that has now spent seven thousand years in a teenage body, unable to get into relationships like Cersei has, and you can see the jealousy of Sprite. Um, you can see her right at the start. Her introduction is that she is 
uh, putting on a glamour that she's older than she is, and then ha- then takes off the glamour to leave uh, to leave the bar effectively. But she because she has to go home for her bedtime. Um, must be really really irritating. Imagine spending six and a half thousand years as a teenager, or seven and a half thousand years at this mm-hmm. stage as a teenager. Can you imagine? Yeah, well, it's physical, and I guess that's the thing is mm-hmm. that for everyone, uh, all the humans looking on, she is that teenager, yeah. but she is hugely sort of grown up in a, a you know uh like she's the storyteller i kind of yeah. you know in yep. that sense um can and can do the glamour and and that kind of element to it absolutely to see the little nods that you mentioned about the storyteller a couple of little nods to sprite and what she's done over history things like effectively i think they kind of say that thena is what gave the world the amazons and the idea of the amazon race and wonder woman effectively they kind of mention that icarus the story of Icarus that's in uh, mythology is from a story that Sprite told yeah. uh, at that time. Also, I think there the inference is that he's the inspiration for Superman too, which I think is a nice little uh, nice little dig at DC. <laughs> we had Icarus; he's been around for a couple of thousand years. Um, lasers coming out of his eyes, alien from another planet. Uh, did Sprite tell that story uh, to uh, to the writers of Superman? You know, and yeah. I, I like that that little touch that she's the storyteller that could have uh, could have created a lot of the myths that we know today. Yeah. Yeah, we get we get these huge kind of we get a lot of hints and nods. So if you look at the the end credits, you see Sprite in talking to like Houdini. Sprite's talking to all these masters of illusion, talking to storytellers. There's in the comic books, Sprite is the is Puck from Midsummer Night, um, uh, and talking to William Shakespeare, giving a, like she is the yeah. the she's the news for a lot of these great storytellers throughout history mm-hmm. so it's kind of hinted at on a lot of this but then like with peter pan it being talked about in the comic books she is hinted at being peter pan because sorry sprite in the comic books is a, a boy mm-hmm. so in the comic book sprite is peter pan i think like in, in neil gaiman's version of the story he's um he's a child star on tv and it's yes. kind of one of those ones that he's been on tv for about six or seven years, and people are kind of starting to wonder why he's staying so young. <laughs> you know, it's that that kind of uh, little twist on it. So, uh, so they do have that incorporated in the movie with uh, with Kingo's character being a Bollywood star for about a hundred years. He's his uh, great great grandfather, great 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 grandfather, his grandfather, and himself all starring in Bollywood movies from the beginning, effectively. So, the greatest uh, dynasty ever in yeah. Bollywood. Yeah, really like that. Uh, but overall, how about the, the attack itself on uh, on London? Like we did see battles throughout the ages but the attack itself on london where we have this kind of more powerful deviant attacking cersei and and, uh and sprite and dane hanging in the background going what the heck is going on (laughs) because he has no idea who these people are again it's really fun to see them because cersei and sprite are not the fighters Mm -hmm. of they are that they are they have the two groups of the eternals fighters and thinkers um or manipulators they seeing how they use their powers Mm -hmm is always fun. Yeah. Because like seeing Cersei turn the bus into petals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the the driver kind of getting out of the the group going huh. What? What just happened? Absolutely. I was kind of wondering, is there a London bus at that time of night that wouldn't have anybody other than the driver on it? Did she turn everybody else on board into patches <laughs> except for the driver? <laughs> I was kind of worried she about She can't change organic. That's true. That is very true. <laughs> um, but then you see Sprite with all the different, the, the illusions, yeah. the glamour of herself. I love that. And I love them all that going was in fun. directions. Yeah. That was really cool. Well, that's, it, it? Yeah, it, it was really, really cool. It, it, it felt... Like with Doctor Strange doing that to Thanos on, on yes. Titan, yeah. um, and the butterflies with the petals. So I, I guess as a, a, but this is um, this is really cool. I, I love the attack on London. You know, you see kind of almost like the the shark fin of the deviant on the canal, mm-hmm. um, and then the 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 big fight. But this this deviant seems to have evolved in the sense that it can it can actually mend itself and. Um, now they're pretty powerful. It takes quite a lot for the we see in that initial big fight mm-hmm. uh, in Mesopotamia, um, that it, it, it takes a lot of attacks from the Eternals yeah. to 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 kill them, and it certainly needs a kind of a bit like a zombie, the head taken off, really, yeah. uh, to to sort them out. Um, and I but, like, yeah, you're right because I like uh, Icarus got injured in that initial attack, and yeah. he looked all powerful. 
um, when he's going after the deviant, but coming back afterwards, and he does have cuts and bruises. Yeah, and we it. see Ajax yeah. healing him. Uh, yeah. So uh, th- th- this was really good, and then seeing Icarus come in uh, to kind of again to using his laser eyes um, or his energy eyes mm-hmm. uh, was was very cool. I have to say, um, you know, I did absolutely love the whole game of throne uh meeting i guess it's of of on, icarus yeah. and uh dane whitman this with is written in the notes here as an extra little point go john yeah no it, i love that we get rob stark and john snow uh meeting again uh and of course uh dane whitman is in black with reference to his black knight and the knight's watch so this was all really nice yeah. even just having cersei as well that <laughs> um <laughs> With with um, Richard Madden effectively falling in love with with Cersei um, here as Icarus again, Richard Madden and Kit Harington both falling in love. With well, Cersei, that's is, true. Is a yes. major character in Game of Thrones. If you haven't watched it, Cersei is probably one of the most evil. Uh, Definitely, bad guys yeah, absolutely. In Game of well, um, just so just to mention, cool. uh, formerly of this parish, as we say, uh, Jason uh, Jason Cabassi, who was uh, who co-hosted one of our shows, he did point out that the last line said by Rob Stark to uh, his brother Jon Snow when Jon Snow is going off to the Night Watch is, "Next time I see you, you'll be all in black." And we do have the Black Knight uh, in this movie coming back and meeting up with Rob Stark. So, and a nice little touch. I'm sure they all were on set going, this will be hilarious. I'm sure they all know, knew it's not a coincidence <laughs> that that was the case. Uh, a fun one as well, Gemma Chan, who plays Cersei, um, is also a, cur- is a curator teacher in uh, the National Museum of Antiquities. Mm-hmm. Um, in Sherlock Holmes, season one, episode two, she is a curator in the National Museum of Antiquities. With Benedict Cumberbatch. Very good. Yeah. Sherlock is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe now. It's taking yes. everything. Everything's involved. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, and actually, no, the, most of the people in that, because Martin Freeman, mm-hmm. uh, you have Benedict Cumberbatch, and you have Gemma Chan, all of them in the Marvel Universe. So at some point, we may get a Sherlock Holmes kind of reunion at that point. Absolutely. That would be great um, to get Moriarty in there as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, quick one as well. Uh, this one, for anyone who's read the Neil Gaiman Eternals, um, there is a nice little Easter egg. As the Deviant is coming out of the River Thames, Mm -hmm. there is a homeless man with his dog, Mm -hmm. is a character from the comic books called Zerus, um, uh, who is one of the main leaders of the Eternals at that point in Mm -hmm. the comic books, and is a homeless man for a while and has a pet dog, and essentially... This is literally it's the same thing. Old homeless man in London with a dog, and you see the deviant. So nice, a nice little kind of nod. And, and so then he he's like Ajax here. That he's yes. the person that can communicate with the celestial with Arisham in this case, um, uh, because that just, I mean it's just Ajax is the only one that. Can talk to can, celestials. Can talk to celestials, which I have yes. to say was, was done really cool as well. I loved um, her going to Arisham. I thought that was yes. pretty cool. Absolutely, yeah. It, it, they're kind of the people who can communicate with celestials kind of change depending on comic okay. books. It's not. It, it's not just. Yeah, one it's not person, fixed. But one celestial kind of pairs with one of the Eternals that they can speak to, and or will only speak to one Eternal. Yeah, and that's the go- the um, golden orb, effectively, that passes to. Cersei, at least in the movie. In the movie, yes, yeah. it is. It is just that that Ajax is the leader. She's the one that talks to the Celestial, uh, and then that orb passes between her. It's and, like the mobile phone, um, I guess, of uh, Eternals and Celestials. Basically, but it's more like the uh, the can on the end of a rope because only that particular can yes. connect to the to the Celestial. Uh, but that's effectively what happens. And uh, after this attack in in London, um, they go to find out that uh, that Ajax has been murdered, which I was really shocked by given that we'd seen the trailer and seen loads of Salma Hayek in, in present day yeah. and I was going okay she's dead how the heck do we get all the rest of those scenes where she yeah. explains what's going Agreed. on to, uh, <laughs> to, to Icarus and, and that kind of stuff so I like that she comes back later on of course uh, in the movie but it was a real surprise to see her dead I just kept going oh they're good. why don't they pick up her body and bring it inside it was was my instant moment where they're all uh, looking at the dead body of Ajax on the ground and then they're sitting inside um, we see Sprite having a memory of Ajax where she's kind of playing um playing the last moment they were together um which again 
maybe think, oh, she's alive. Of course, this is just, there's no way an Eternal can be killed effectively. But, um, but that's how the, um, the deviants are getting more power. They're, they're killing Eternals now and taking their powers from them. So, uh, so we see that main, um, deviant that we saw in London. We see that, that deviant a couple of times more. That's Crow, who has now become a more powerful deviant, deviant and is eventually going to start becoming, looking more, uh, human-like, I suppose, by the yeah. end of the movie as he takes more and more powers. Um, and, and it's where we then see this orb move into to Cersei as well as she is kind of made leader. It's, it's almost, it, it, it's, um, it's intimated that Ajax has chosen her to, to mm. replace her if she ever dies um, at, at some point because, and as it plays out because of her affinity and her empathy with the human race and um, that a lot of people thought that it would have been um, Icarus mm. as, as her right hand man effectively. So this is the one I'm not sure whether I fully understand. So Ajak has been the leader of the Eternals and she is aware of the plan. Yes. So she knows exactly what's going to happen, that they're all there to get the human race up to a certain level. And that when it gets up to that level, a new celestial will rise, killing the entire planet. Yes. She tells Icarus this and Icarus kind of loses it a bit. But Runs realizes away because he doesn't can't he, he'll end up telling people and he doesn't want to lie to them so he goes off by himself and runs yeah. away from Cersei and, and, and he specifically he 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 leaves Cersei mm-hmm. and that's that's the reason is because he knows how much she cares for um the the human race yeah. and he now knows the plan the long term plan because it is to that point where they they leave from um you know and, and they separate uh um, and it, it's they'll wait for Arisham to contact it. It, 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 it you know, th- th- there's that period of 500 years or so where it's like, well, what are we doing in a sense from mm. from the um, from the celestials yeah. and only Ajax and I guess soon after that, Icarus know that they're waiting. Um, for the population size to be of a certain level where they're used effectively as an energy source to um, create a new celestial in the form of Tiamat. Well, to raise the new celestial. To raise it, yeah. yeah. So, so that's my question. Why, then, is, is it Cersei that's chosen as leader? Because Cersei will protect the planet from the rise of the, of the new um, celestial because she has so much love for the planet. I would have expected that it would have been Icarus because... Ajax knew what was going to happen. She, she so Ajax changes her mind. Yeah, Ajax so changes that's her it, mind. That's what I'm trying to work out. That, that's the that's the moment in, in kind of flashback. We, we we see it in in the the trailer where she's telling Icarus about you know with the snapback um, of of all the human race with the mm-hmm. the defeat of Thanos that all the all, you know all these humans half the population of the world has returned effectively Thanos. Um, effectively put on hold the creation of the celestial by taking out yeah. half the population and um, and that that now it's time and she so in that flashback she says to Icarus and in the movie then it expands to say that you know in that time since um the Aztec Empire where they were she has also come uh, to care a lot for the human race mm-hmm. and, and what they've achieved and how they've progressed and, and so on and this is where then again a, a, another little sort of pull of the rug for me that we see Icarus betraying her on on the basis that he's still got the purity of the mission and the the righteousness of of, of this this mission yeah and um, so as to Chris says she ultimately has second thoughts I guess and and ultimately decides that she doesn't want to see this mission fulfilled either yeah so this is where the complexity always comes in with the flashbacks and things being revealed out of order I suppose for me <laughs> this, is, this is where it came in in the movie so she revealed it to Icarus somewhere around 1700 or 1800 a couple of hundred years after the whole team split she revealed to Icarus yes. the plan that's when he left Cersei or very soon after that he left Cersei because he couldn't lie to her yeah. and then Ajax calls Icarus back to her about eight days before the attack on London to say the world has been returned to a point now that 
it is ready for the arrival of the celestial, but we need to stop it. And Icarus tells her, actually, there are deviants already available and pushes her over and get and kills her effectively. Yeah. So because he wants to follow the mission, she wants to get all the Eternals back together to protect the Earth. Uh, now yes. Because yes. She's, because she's now yes. on the side of protecting Earth against everything. Right. Yes. Yeah. Cersei ultimately then takes on the, I guess, the, the revised mission for the Eternals that Ajax was planning on doing by then after she's she's learnt the truth from Arisham that effectively this planet will be destroyed with the the birth of a, a new celestial um and so um that leads to then the the reuniting of of the Eternals absolutely we haven't really talked about the visuals of the movie but I have to say those moments with Arisham and with an eternal, whichever one it is that that speaks to him, on Earth going and seeing the celestial being uh, out in the universe. That they're directly taken from uh, Jack Kirby's run uh, from the seventies. They really do feel that epic, uh, really unusual th- yeah. side of anything that we've seen before. It doesn't feel like something that could just sit directly into a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. There's a real style to those scenes, and they do look absolutely fabulous it's uh, beautiful I, I must say i think the visual look of the movie the mm-hmm. design and, and it is is gorgeous and i think even just the um you know that close-up of the celestials but even at the end where arisham sort of you know peers over the planet earth mm-hmm. uh, just you know it, it felt very death starry from rogue one you know where you see uh, the Death Star appearing through the haze of the atmosphere, so you get that you know it's sl- it slightly kind of foggy look to it, I guess. But it, it was just really very, very cool. Yeah. Um, I thought that was su- really nicely done. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of said that this is the halfway point of the movie, and we've uh, we have obviously talked a lot about the history of the Eternals. Um, let's talk about the reuniting of the Eternals because there are lots of stories of what's been going on with each of the. Uh, each of the teams since they broke up, I suppose. Uh, already mentioned, really, Kingo uh, has been starring in Bollywood movies. He now has um, his valet uh, or uh, film filmographer, Karun, um, who has been with him for 50 years. I really like this character, Karun. I think he's quite quite fun um, having him trying to film everything that's going on to make this documentary that <laughs> Kingo wants to make. Yeah. But there's also just a, a lovely touch within this character. I know he's a bit of the comic relief for the movie, but I think there's a lovely touch with him effectively not wanting to leave this movie that he's working on because it's not that he's obsessed with fame or anything like that. It's that he's set up this entire studio system which has so many people dependent on him and he doesn't want to let all those people down. There is that love inside him, like with many of the other Eternals, for the humans they've interacted with. And it comes across really well in that moment when... Uh, when they all say, no, you need to go and take care of take care of this, uh, Karun tells him he needs to go off and do the mission that he's here for. They'll all be fine without him kind of thing. But I do think this idea that he's built up his own community around him is really is really special to Kingo. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like I have to I enjoy Kingo a lot and yeah. I also really enjoyed Karun. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, and Karun is, as you said, comic relief. But there's even just a small part of him which is the he consistently thanks the Eternals yeah. for everything they've done yeah. throughout the film. It's like, no, I want to be here with you guys. Like you guys are have saved, continuously saved the world or saved humans or blah, blah blah blah. That show of humanity is really good throughout yeah. the film, and I really do. And it's that. really important, I think, to have in there. And so I, I think it's really, um, it, it's props to Chloe Zhao uh, that you know that is that perspective is there uh, from. Karun. Um, yeah, I really like this dynamic as well. Um, I just thought it was really, um, it was just another perspective, another sort of iteration on, um, in effect, Kingu falls halfway house to some extent between, say, what Cersei has and, and what, um, Icarus ultimately has, which is that, you know, theologically so to speak i guess or mission wise is still on the page of icarus around the aims Mm -hmm. but he has created this whole community um around him um and he has that affection for um karun and all the people that in the same way that cersei has and effectively you know removes himself from that final battle because actually he can't really uh, come down on any side of that and um, because in in some ways he agrees with both and yeah. um, to 
in, in that sense. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's really interesting about it. What did you think of this overall kind of just before we get into the fight? I, there's basically we can just talk before we get into the the fight at the compound. I just want to see what you thought of like bringing what Druig's been up to. What you think of Fastos? What you think of McCarry? How they've reintroduced all those characters? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think I think Fastos is probably my favorite story um, of uh, of the background characters. Yeah. I suppose he's, he's he does have. Uh, have less screen time than, as you mentioned before, Chris, the major characters of Cersei and, and Icarus. But his story of someone that's trying to advance the pace of human development with technology that he can provide to them, this idea that if we had aliens come down from another world that was more the, more advanced than us, they could cure everything. And that seems to be where Fastos is coming from at the beginning. He's, you know, saying he wants to bring the steam engine to the planet 2000 years before we had any other form of, uh, form of technological development. You know, that was his plan all along was what could I do to aid the development of human society. And I love that we have that flashback moment to him in 1945 when the bomb is dropped on Hiroshima and he's standing in the wake of it, realizing what they, what the humans have done with the possibilities of the technology he could have provided yeah. and just losing all faith in humanity. I think that's a, a beautifully shot scene. That's a beautiful moment for a person that had so much belief in the human race to be so distraught by them. And that's yeah. why he's cut himself off from everybody and unwilling to come back to the Eternals until yeah. he finds his husband and uh, and has a child, um, which brings him back to the love of the human race, realizing there's another another side of humanity. It's not everybody in the world, every human in the world that would have created an atom bomb and dropped it on other humans. There are there are other good things about humanity. I love that storyline that's played quite well in just a few minutes. It's given on screen. Yeah, I, th- I think it's really concise storytelling. I mean, in some ways, you know. Um, in, in his own way, Fastos gets Druig's moment from, um, uh, from 1512, but at, in 1945, mm-hmm. where he, he has that moment to retreat from everything. And he does that on the basis of, you know, him bringing technology to the humans to make them progress, mm-hmm. um, in positive ways. And it, it's taken for the development of, of weaponry and in this sense you know real mass um weaponry with capabilities to wipe out entire cities Mm -hmm. um i mean it's interesting because ultimately in the aztec moment you see the conquistadors with muskets and very much more advanced compared to the aztecs and so even at that moment um, I guess maybe he has that inkling and he just sees how far it goes. I mean, we don't see that storyline, but that's the way I kind of thought about it was he sees where his the technology that he's introduced, uh, not necessarily the introduced the musket, but gunpowder, the idea of explosion, mm-hmm. um, has been utilized. And you, you, you have that conversation of Druig, you know, where why did we advance or th- this this part of the world more than others because that was the you know it was like the meeting of aliens um ultimately uh, on earth with conquistadors and aztecs very you know very similar stages of civilization but with very different technologies or ultimately uh, and very different so, uh, practices and cultures and it, it sort of moves through where he sort of, you know, retreats from it all in the same way that Druig does. So I, I see a lot of commonality there for very different reasons. Um, but, uh, I think then seeing how he comes back to, um, connecting with this planet that he's on through his husband, uh, Ben and, uh, the love of Ben and his the their son Jack. Um, and I thought that representation was really good actually. It felt yep. very, very natural. And it felt ve- it very very unforced. And I thought that was just great. Absolutely. Actually. I think I think I was sitting in the cinema with Safa John, obviously uh, being in a gay couple, seeing uh, uh, gay characters on screen, and I was absolutely going, they're gonna do the Marvel swerve. They're gonna have Brian Tyree Henry going, I'm a gay man with a husband. They won't really interact. They'll talk to each other from the opposite side of a room, basically. Um, they'll have, you know, representation in, they'll say all these things in the script, but no actual representation on screen. I am so happy they had a moment where two husbands are standing side by side with each other, one sending the other off to a battle, giving each other a kiss and sending them off like they do with every other kind of couple that you would have mm-hmm. in this universe. 
And it annoys me that we yeah. got so happy earlier on this year when we had Loki saying potentially he might possibly have been bisexual at some point in the past. And we were so happy with that being the kind of representation that was being brought to the MCU. Now we actually have proper representation in this movie. I'm so happy to see it on screen. Um, it was it was really good. Really, well, really well it, it's played so naturally, that, but yeah. matter of factly. And that, that's, yes. that's the that's the great thing about it. That's exactly. the power around that. Yeah. yeah, there was no fanfare. It wasn't like this huge thing. Look, we've got a gay couple. Oh my god, check this. Look, we're great. We're great. like it was just it was. Yeah. And that's where we are with a lot of this film. And again, before we get there's different couples, ethnicities, races, religions, um sexuality, everything is in this. Mm-hmm. It is a melting pot of a film and it's all played matter of fact. Absolutely. There's just like even Macari being deaf, yeah. and it's just like that's a new thing for the for the film. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. It's just based on that because she goes so fast, her eardrums ruptured because of the sonic booms, mm. and that's why they are deaf. And it's just ASL. I think they're speaking um, American Sign Language in a lot of it, which is. Slightly weird, but sure. <laughs> Should be like their own one, but no. It and it's just it's all very nice and like everything is just matter of fact. Absolutely, um, and you chose how much the media has attacked all of this stuff before the movie has come out. The the reviews bombing that's been going on on Rotten Tomatoes. The the news stories about Marvel has the first ever gay couple two and a half years before the movie came out. The movie comes out. This scene happens, and it's totally dealt with as exactly how any other couple would be dealt with in the movie um i i love that when you sit down and watch the movie and give the movie its due for what it's presenting for you it isn't making as you say chris a fanfare out of every single character that's on screen everybody's being dealt with exactly the same way as steve rogers being the character he is was dealt with or tony stark the character he is is being dealt with none of it is fanfare look over here look at what we're doing except how it's being dealt with in the press yeah well interesting enough uh as of uh essentially release date which was what the fifth uh they said they're not um making any edits to the film so there's a lot of kind of like it may not release in the middle east it's not going to release in china because of uh chloe Zhao. so like there's definitely um there's a few places that they're they're sticking to their guns. There's no fanfare, but they're sticking to their guns that this is an important thing, absolutely, and they haven't yes, made they yeah absolutely yeah. like the the constant attack that Marvel has had for many years and Disney has had for many years that they pander to audiences by toning down their language, by toning down their descriptions of things, and by toning down what they show on screen. So if they were to do that again with a movie like this and pull out scenes just to appease the market and get the money from them it would just make a mockery of what they're trying to create as the new version of Marvel Studios under Kevin Feige. A lot of that stuff uh, that they did in the past was under Ike Perlmuller and on the uh, on the Marvel side and on the Disney side. So, uh, so now that he's gone, I'm glad that they're making these movies and not willing to make changes just for individual countries. Um, if they don't want to watch them, that's absolutely fine. No, no reason for them to be released over there. Yeah. How about some of the other characters? I know a, a big other storyline uh, that I think works really well in the movie. We have Thena and Gilgamesh. This idea that Thena has had this break in her mind, I think it's dealt with really well. It feels really like dementia that the character's going through, that she she sometimes forgets where she is. There's even that conversation with uh, Fastos' son, Jack, later on, that she kind of forgets what's going on and doesn't know exactly what uh, what situation she's in. She's got to focus really hard to, to keep her, her mind together effectively. And this is a lovely relationship that they have between Gilgamesh and Cena. It's not stated out loud that there's anything other than a friendship between the two of them, but the fact that he's willing to spend eternity, however long that may be, protecting her and making sure she's safe rather than wiping what Thena was in the past and wiping all of those memories yeah. out of her, I think is a, a, a lovely relationship between the two of them. Agreed. Um, I, I think just in, uh, throughout the film, and even into later on with uh, some of the fights and the, the sacrifices, it's just played beautifully. And the stay, stay here, the hand, very Hulk, Black Widow, mm-hmm. um, in terms yeah. of that part. Um, and then just how that plays out later on with 
um, theme and his character is, is fantastic. It's literally in the next kind of bit we need to talk about it, which is Drug and where he's based. They, they have uh, Drug has his commune, as you mentioned, Chris. This is a commune built from um, the Aztec society, which he's kept alive for generations uh, after that initial battle. Um, and they all converge there to uh, to meet Drug. And we have the deviant attack, um, yeah. which I know, John, you... you were I, I love this. Well. I thought this was the most atmospheric it for me it had it th- these scenes um th- this this forest fight um you know were some of the uh the the best shots and, and visuals from the yeah. trailer um and i i love the action here i mean i i really like the action across all of, mm. of this i mean it, it it feels to me rather than it being an action adventure it's more like a drama adventure with yeah. really good action um or a drama adventure action movie i guess <laughs> um it was just really nicely balanced from that for me uh, and i love the uh, this forest fight um i thought it was really atmospheric just under sort of the almost the dusk created by the 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 forest um but you you see that moment where one of the deviants is coming down the tree trunk stops as the blacksmith is hammering away and i guess you know was it drawn out too long by chloe i i don't think so i was just there going okay when's it gonna happen because it really just sort of drew drew it out so much and then I totally agree. Any other director of any Marvel movie would have had that blacksmith taken out. Yeah, exactly. And 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 been, that would be the first attack, and then they maybe find his body, and then that extends the scene. What Chloe Zhao has done here, just having the shadows in the background, and if you happen to see them, then you're waiting for the attack. If you don't happen to see them, if you just just miss that shadow in the background, you're not expecting an attack. But from that moment, if you have seen it, you're kind of waiting for something to happen, and it doesn't need an attack to make you as on the edge of your seat for the attack, or me anyway. Yeah, Yeah, and uh, you have, I mean, I think the Icarus uh, fights are just spectacular, um, flying up through the canopy in in the air, but also where, you know, the the, the power deviant manages to crush his head down and he's fighting this, uh, and it ultimately requires someone to come and help. Mm-hmm. and to to get him out of that bind i just thought all these were just really good visuals now, i love the moment where drug's got all the um all the people sort of just firing the the weapon um at all, all the guns at one of the the deviants mm-hmm. uh you, we, here we see a new um power effectively of of cersei where she is able she, so effectively her power is she can ch- change uh the material nature of 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 uh, all inert materials but she can't do um living or organic and uh, she can't change uh organics effectively mm-hmm. and here we see her creating a a tree out of one of the deviants when she's kind of been forced into a pond mm-hmm. and, and is fighting to to save her life really from this deviant attack so but I, I love the moment where she sort of just puts part of the tree into water, changes the rest of it to effectively silver or sort of some kind of metallic, uh, and to to cage the deviant. And then you have Druid coming in with all his um all the 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 people from the camp, and they're just firing sort of really sort of in sync. Oh, that, that was yeah. really really cool. It must have taken so. Uh, that's that's something I want to see in the making of. Just the choreography of getting that many people to do the exact same movement at the same time. That was really cool. Yeah, and um, and also this is where we get to see the more kind of human form of this deviant as mm-hmm. he absorbs and ultimately kills Gilgamesh and um, to become a uh, crow. Yeah, Gilgamesh sacrificing himself to save. Well, the rest of the Eternals, but mostly Cena, yeah. um, so that she can't go. And I guess, uh, again, puts that cap on the arc, as you mentioned, Chris, is that kind of ending of the arc that he's been protecting her for this many centuries and is willing to give up his life to save her, but unfortunately makes the Deviant even more powerful by giving him um, his powers. Yeah. And for me, this I, I, I'm right there with you guys. This, for me, was one of the better fight scenes. Um, it was, you got to see, again, everyone's use of their powers, it, it was capped with an emotional ending. Mm-hmm. When you have Thena and you're constantly told of how much of a warrior she is, a fierce warrior, and essentially she is 
hamstrung. So they yeah. basically, as the Eternals as a team, are basically slightly, they have their Achilles heels that Thena can turn, and she does turn multiple times, and they're fighting her while trying to calm her down and then fighting the Deviants. So it, it's an, it's a fun thing to watch and see. And then it's just this emotional arc. Now, it, it's the up that Druig joins them and releases the people. Mm-hmm. And then the down that Gilgamesh is dead. And yeah. Athena is still. And it's like, what do we do next? Let's go get Fastos. Let's move forward. Let's figure it all out. Um, the ending there where they then all come back together to go to get Domo, their ship, mm-hmm. is just, for me, was beautiful because they go to the site of the Hanging Gardens of yeah. Babylon. Yeah. And it's always been there and it's just under. And as the Domo rises, you see the, the, the city of Babylon underneath yeah, it. Yeah, that was And cool. I was like, yeah. that's nice. Well done. Yeah. They, they, this has been like in case under. And then you get to see Makari again. And she's been living there for the whole time by herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, just speed reading away. It's really interesting. Uh, after- it's like as if she didn't get the message. Um, you know, from Ajax says, go out, make lives for yourself in the world. And then come back and tell me what you've learned, basically, whenever the next message comes in. And it's like McCary is kind of going, yeah, but we've accomplished our mission. Now it's time to go home and just goes and sits on this ship yeah. getting as much information as she possibly can about the world. So she's learned through reading and learned through um, through artworks and, and learned through uh, various artifacts that she's gathered together because she can go in and out, I suppose, of the ship. But it seems like she's just been sitting there learning from uh, from for 2000 years, effectively. And searching for the emerald, emerald tablet. Mm. What is the emerald tablet? We will find out in a future movie when the Eternals return, Chris. Oh my god! I know. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I hope this is not a thread that just drops because I, I was like, you've mentioned it twice now, and it's found, and this like we've seen it. I'm like, I literally, I, and I, I did a bit of quick. I'm like, there's a lot of emerald things in the. The, in the the Marvel comic universe, and there's a lot of tablets in the comic universe. So I'm like, it could be a mishmash of anything. It could be nothing. But they they pointed out so many times. I'm like, oh god, like what? Are, you should please just tell me next time. And I thought I thought it was just something to do with how they were creating the Unimind. I thought it was some basic plan that Fastos was using to create the Unimind because it was so important to as you say, mentioning it out loud over and over again. And when they go and meet Makari, who's the last member of the crew to get together, she's got the tablet right there. Um, you, you see Drew pick it up and go and, and giving her a kiss and saying, thank you, of course you'd have it kind of thing. So I just assumed that there would be a connection to the final plan. So I guess there wasn't. I guess there was no, no. way of connecting the two things. Yeah. Because she was stealing from the humans mm. back in the days of Babylon to find this emerald tablet. Yeah, uh, And I'm like, Okay, what else could it be? Like, it's going to be like it's connected to like the dark hold or the sorcery elements or something like that. Yeah. There's going to be, it is going to be like part of the new like Book of Cthulhu or the yeah. dark hold. It's it's going to pop up in yeah. multiple places. It was even it was even we see Excalibur of uh, Arthur's sword, and I'm just wondering will that connect in with the Black Knight's ebony blade as well, yeah. um, which would be really cool. I mean, it almost feels you know the 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 medieval elements of the Marvel universe also introduced here in that sense. So it, they they so it's Sprite saying to Athena, "Is that the ebony blade?" And it's then, no, it's a Scalibur. Yeah. And he goes, oh, Merlin was always a funny one. So, Scalibur is the one of the main weapons outside of the amulet with for Captain Britain. Captain Britain is in, or was in, both the Scalibur, the team, but also uh, MI3, uh, which is this secret kind of sorcery group led by Captain Britain, which had the Black Knight in it, but also Blade. Because... Yes. MI3, along with Black Knight, Blade, and Captain Britain, are this big sorcery ones and used to fight lots and lots of vampires. Yeah. I think Excalibur, Captain Britain, and a few others might turn up in Blade because... But no, we do have Captain Britain from uh, from What If. We have uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Captain Carter. So. And we also, as well, the the current... Uh, the, the, the run of Doctor Strange and the Sorcerer's Supreme... Um, also had Merlin in as well. Oh, there you go. Ooh, nice. Yeah. yeah. 
So, did you ever think when talking about Marvel on uh, Marvel and movies, especially getting to a, effectively a space opera that is the Eternals that we'd be talking about medieval times, talking about vampires, talking about uh, people like Merlin and a blade getting together in a, in a team up. Um, this universe can go anywhere, really, can't it? <laughs> it really can. Yeah. And, and because the whole thing is they're pulling from multiple comic book runs more, and they're twisting and they're turning and everything. Yeah. It's It could go anywhere. Because, say, even this film, where they had two or three good versions, they just mashed multiple bits and elements and took bits and things from multiple things and put them all together to make their own amalgam version. And I'm like, yeah, you could go anywhere with this. There could be a purely... the the Excalibur, which was a mutant team, is now just purely non-mutant, English-based kind of team fighting vampires there you go but that but that's not new for the mcu either at all that this is what the mcu has always done is taken bits of comic books and it's it's also not new for comic books like you know you couldn't really read neil gaiman's version of the eternals as a direct translation or a direct follow-up to jack kirby's eternals he was taking elements of it and twisting them and changing them for the present world that he was writing it at that time yeah and there's been another version of the eternals which is much more recent there's been two other versions of the eternals which are much more recent. Gillian's another yeah. irishman yeah kieran gillen's is the most recent run but there's one in between the two that has another change to the story another change to the eternals and their motivations these are characters that are um smaller characters in the marvel universe and do get changed quite a lot in yeah. this world so the mcu making their own change to their motivations and who's the uh, villainous one, I suppose, or who turns on the team is very much in keeping with the history of the Eternals. Oh yeah, and like speaking of who turns on the team here, our final battle, really stopping of the the rise of the Celestial. I like that there are people that turn on them, and I like that Cersei. I think makes the statement at the end that everybody's just going with the, what they believe, and there's nothing wrong with that. She's not holding anything against Icarus and Sprite by the end of this massive battle because they've gone against the team. They were just going with what their beliefs were and what, what they felt was the right way to deal with what was going on. Yeah. Um, Icarus has known about this for many years and his plan was always to release the Celestial uh, on, on the planet, effectively. Yeah. And then Sprite sides with him because Sprite's in love with Icarus and has been for 6,000 years. Yeah. But a bit of a shocker? That's, uh, yes. That, that Sprite well, turned sorry. Cersei? Oh, Sprite, no. Uh, Because uh, you kind of, from the Peter Pan moment, it is kind Mm. of said that there's a love there. So not really there. Icarus is the one. Uh, This is partially the one. I I enjoy the betrayal. I enjoy the character. Like you said, usually it's Druig. Druig is usually the bad guy. He is the evil eternal, essentially, in the comic books. Neil Gaiman's run and some of the later ones. He he but, separates himself from the Eternals for his yes. own gain, for the most part. He actually tries not to go up against the Eternals because they're all as powerful as him. He's kind of. I think there's one where he signs a treaty where he's given an entire state Country. to himself, where yep. he sets it up like Doctor Doom, effectively in Laveria. He sets up his own state, and the agreement that he has with the Eternals is, you don't interfere with whatever I'm doing, yep. <laughs> and I won't come anywhere near you, yep. basically. So, uh, so, th- so Droog is. A villain, but is almost a villain to other people, not to the Eternals. He's just a part of the Eternals, but he happens to try and avoid them. Uh, yes, way. and so. the, he hates Car- uh, Icarus, and Icarus hates him. Mm-hmm. But for me, the this was the one I just... It, it was a strange choice. I don't bump up against it. I just... I don't know whether it's... Icarus is the the actor, the, just his portrayal of that kind of just stoicism uh, and, and and kind of devout portrayal of Icarus and a, of a religious zealot who is, I will do whatever, even if I must be destroyed and I will be reborn. It is our purpose, etc., etc., etc. I don't know if I bump up against that. I don't know. This this is the essentially the crux of it for me. I th- I think you're supposed to bump up against yeah. it if you hold the view that he shouldn't be devout or righteous in his his devotion to the mission. So that's the point. If, yeah. Because that's not necessarily how. I mean, from what you're saying, that's not 
the choice you would make in yeah. that situation. And okay, you might be slightly biased because you're human. Uh, but, <laughs> you know. I want to survive. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I don't. I, it, it's, a, it's just strange. It's not because devotion has has produced that many times before mm-hmm. we're in across countless whether it's religious um concepts or whether it's um non-religious concepts or you know there has been that devotion to people that have actually made them go seemingly against logic but it's in their own logic and their yeah. own rational framework that they they do this and i think that's what's simply happened with um with Icarus and actually he's made that choice a long time ago because yeah. he decided to separate from Circe who could have been the only one that would have or could have possibly changed his mind on, on that and um, if they had stayed together over the course of that 600 odd uh, years after um after the the fall of the the Aztec empire and yeah. um, so I, I think that's the whole point. You're supposed to butt up against Icarus um, if you're not aligned with what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I, I think it goes, it, it's to the point of about, I I guess, devotion to a cause and, and righteousness rather than whether it's good or evil. I mean, it can be that as well, mm-hmm. um, depending on the type of righteousness. And I just think the the modification of Icarus is Kingo, where he says, I agree with him. Look at the countless billions that we're preventing from coming into being um, through the creation of new galaxies with mm. the, the power being that will, that will be um, created through the awakening and the creation of Timut. And, um, and, but at the same time, I don't want to fight my, you know, brothers and sisters of the Eternals. And, um, you know, he, he, he's kind of the moderate in that sense. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think what's good about it is it gives that full spectrum ultimately. Exactly. Um, at different stages of their time on Earth as well. You know, I think, uh, Druig, that realization of wanting to interfere more with with is, is the same idea, uh, and now here Cersei is wanting to absolutely interfere with with the mission, which is to stop the the awakening of a celestial. And it's also the fact that what Druid learns is the reason why they're not allowed to interfere is because if you have war and humans die in war, you will have a baby boom afterwards, which will feed into the plan of filling up the planet with more humans. Whereas he's kind of going, but I could save them from dying. I could save them from battling each other and killing each other. Why can't I interfere? And they're going, oh, well, don't tell him the reason why he can't. It's just, they tell him it's about development of the human race, but actually it's about feeding the power that will raise the celestial. So the true villain of the, of the whole movie is the person that we see probably least would just hear about it is Arashem because he is a person that has a vocal connection to the Eternals on Earth and is telling them this is coming. Be prepared for the death for the death of the entire planet and the celestial to rise. Um, Icarus has that kind of disconnect from the world, probably because he separated himself so much. He realizes they've done this to various planets before. So what's another planet? He'll just sit there and wait until the moment presents itself. Erishim is their god. Erishim tells him to do it. He will be become he will become the right hand of their god Erisham and allow the celestial to rise and the death of the planet. So um, so it's not new for him. He's just gone, okay, well, now I know what our mission is here. That is the mission that's been, that, that we've been sent here to accomplish effectively. But so the rest of them, other than King goes a little bit in between both sides, the rest of them are on the side of protecting the humans like they have done for 7,000 years. A really interesting idea. Again, it's not like the Avengers going up in a battle to punch things in the face to pr- prevent the humans in the immediate vicinity of surviving it's got that real complexity to it of an argument for and against you know icarus's argument is simply i've done this many times before i've just had my wine, my wine wiped afterwards so why does this particular planet matter more than the others did yeah which is a really interesting story for a marvel movie to go down isn't it it's yeah it's, yeah. it's different it's, it's, it's really different. different i think that's the thing and that's the challenge i think that is potentially there for the audience um and i 
I guess ultimately it comes down to your sensibilities mm-hmm. in, in some respect. But I, I again, I, I think it's a really s- quite successful actually in how it does it. Um, and I think th- this this final battle to stop the rise of the celestial it is just re- it is really good. I mean, I, I like that we see Fastos getting in and using his tech to effectively oh, yeah. restrict. Icarus thing mm-hmm. that's really it's really cool. cool. Yeah. Um, we really see um, you know, that great uh moment for Makari where she's creating the the dust storm from the beach uh, around Icarus, mm-hmm. um, and and then Crow as well. Uh, but also you you see um Athena versus Crow is a great battle too, where Athena's yes beating down on him. He's trying to use the knowledge that he's gained from absorbing Gilgamesh as well. He's yeah. trying to use the words yeah. that Gilgamesh said. But I love that Athena's still able to keep her composure and take him out. That's really that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's really good. And then we see Cersei sort of that that moment where she created the I guess. I mean are Celestials organic? I pre- because they don't look it, yeah. do they? And um, like Aramesh does look like a massive hunk of like some kind of rock. Uh, but that I they are sentient, they are organic in that sense. Yes. If you think uh, nowhere, which is in Gardens of Galaxy, is the head of a dead celestial, yeah. and they mine the organic the brain brain yeah. of the celestial exactly. for um, um, and stuff. Right, and so she uses her hands to effectively do a massive celestial popsicle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I thought the awakening of it was was very cool. I loved the imagery of yes. the fingers coming out of the ocean um, and the head coming starting to rise and that sort of that yellow gold of, of Tiamat. Um, I just think that's really awesome. And it's to think I really want a future MCU uh, movie to kind of reference the fact that there is this like new formation coming out of yeah. the Indian, Indian Ocean. So, oh. um, yeah, I thought that was pretty awesome to be honest. Very cool. I think they're gonna have to. I think yeah. they, 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 it's gonna have to be a net, it, talked about at some point. It's just like, by the way, we've now got this massive thing. I mean, I love the idea, like, really towards the end. I think there was some CGI seagulls or seabirds sort of, like, going around, the, you yeah. know, the, the cliffs of the fingers. And, I, you know, basically the amount of, of bird poop that's going to be on, on <laughs> Tiamat's fingers when, yeah. I, I guess, if, if he does awaken in, in some way that doesn't kill Earth is is pretty uh, interesting. Yeah, um, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> no, I don't but, think so either by how they've said it, but... Yeah, but the humans do have a few other things to worry about. You know, like the, this is just the rise of something new in the ocean. They may not be able to know exactly what it is unless they see it with their own eyes or a little bit of investigations done. <laughs> Whereas in our final point, the aftermath, the end of the movie, we do have Arashem themselves arriving over planet Earth, <laughs> which can be seen from planet Earth. Yeah. Picking up three of the Eternals, picking up Kingo, Cersei, and fastos taking them from their homes and dragging them out into space <laughs> like that's going to be on the news for a few weeks at the very yeah. least right? yeah yeah definitely <laughs> half the world sees this yeah it's, it's over london <laughs> yeah, but also I, I presume over the u.s with fastos being taken up and uh, yeah. and kingo we don't know where he went with sprite i presume he was on the way back to india or was he taking care of sprite or was sprite going to boarding school sprite's now, going to boarding girl. school yeah um she's now a, a, a true human i wasn't sure whether she was going to be staying with kingo while going to board boarding school or he was just dropping her off and then heading back to uh back to india i suppose She's six thousand years old, so she doesn't actually need a guardian. But no, but she may doesn't actually need education. But it's good for her. Yes, yeah. Um, I think Sprite will be back in some form because Sprite is the only eternal, non-eternal, ex-eternal left who is able to basically talk to people and tell them what happened. Yeah. So Dane Whitmore will be able to find Sprite and uh, kind of talk to other people and I know, I know this is a terrible thing to to uh, have in mind when you're watching a Marvel movie but I was there the whole movie going this was filmed in 20, uh, 18, 2019 I think and then it finished a bit of extra film was done in 2020 just because of lockdowns and, and how the shutdown happened and I was looking at the actress who played Sprite going 
they better do something in this movie to release her for being an eternal teenager because she's a very young actress playing this role. <laughs> and if they don't do something yeah, in the yeah. storyline to sort this out, when they come back to film with her, even for her cameo scene, she's going to look 25 <laughs> and it won't, it will not work. So I, they, they clearly had to do something in here. And it makes sense for the character arc of this character that spent thousands of years as a teenager. It makes sense to release her from that and definitely uh, and, and move it along to, uh, to allow her to grow. But now she has no powers. That's the, yes. that's the big difference. She's no longer a powered eternal. Yeah. No, she is essentially being turned from, a, from an inorganic to an organic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and we have when Arisham is, I guess, has them in 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 judgment um, for I, I I guess them going against uh, mission. Uh, the it's interesting because I think the original comics have that celestials make a judgment on planets yep. as to whether yes. they're worthy to exist yes. effectively, yep. um, and that is ultimately where it comes back to which is um in, instead of um the the exploding planets with the awakening and, and birth of the celestials from them using all that energy is that Arisham is well I will leave them and I'll come back to pronounce judgment on on the human race yeah. um at some future date so yeah, yeah. you know that threat uh, in terms of it the judgment of arishan has is, hasn't gone uh, it's there for for the planet um and he's going to use the memories of the eternals again the comic book version is the the judgment is based on the memories of the eternals yes. the, the information they're feeding back and there's no uh there's no specific um timeline given for when the end of the planet that the eternals are on uh will come but it is, it's just fed back and eventually a judgment will be made by a, a celestial as to whether that planet should survive or not. So uh, that's kind of the threat of, of being an eternal and getting too close to humans. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. is this could happen any day. We're, depending on what we're feeding back to our uh, celestial god, let's say, of, uh, of Arisham, uh, it may just decide, that, well, actually, this planet doesn't deserve, deserve to exist and kill it. Um, yes, they call it the hosts. The first host, second host, third host. Uh, is when they come to judge and they are they it's essentially yay nay or continue the experiment mm-hmm. yeah um, so that's from the comic books yeah anything else about where we have left everybody else we've got um as we said three of three of the eternals being dragged out into space by uh by arisham we've got um icarus sending himself into the sun uh kind of fulfilling the story that that was created for him by uh by sprite back in uh back in mythology that he is the uh the being that flew too close to the sun. Does that mean the last time we're going to see Icarus? Don't know. Does he die? Um, he doesn't technically have wings. Um, and he is, but he ultimately, he may survive that, I yeah. guess. I mean, it's, it's almost like a, an act of self immolation, isn't it? Really, yeah. that it, that he does this. Um, I feel like I feel like he survived, but he is the he is the only eternal that can fly, isn't he? That's what he's that's what he says is the kind of his special benefit. He can fly basically, so uh, flying himself towards the sun is where we kind of leave him. Right, we don't see him burning up or exploding or uh, being beheaded. So I think we may see Icarus back. <laughs> in the yeah, if, if you don't see the body, he he's not. Yeah, dead, exactly. Potentially, or yeah. he he may not be dead. Yeah. And then. My favorite uh, kind of, I, I'm going to say joke to the audience that may not have enjoyed watching 10 brand new characters being introduced <laughs> in the movie The Eternals. Uh, we have McCary, uh, Droog, and Thena going out into space to find all of the other potentially thousands of Eternals that are in the universe <laughs> yeah. on other planets and waking them up. So these are not the only Eternals in the galaxy. And I love that little kind of. I think that's a little poke at people that may have thought there's too many characters in this movie. Well, guess what? We could have had a thousand more characters in this movie if we'd wanted to. Uh, there is so many more that they haven't brought in. Yeah, and yeah. they're good ones as well. Like, mm-hmm. um, But yeah, like I, this for me was fun because I thought this is... I'm down for a Druig, Macari and Thena s- spin-off. Absolutely. I was like, that's a Disney Plus show I'm happy to watch. Yeah. I'd rather see a movie of it. Uh, rather than true, true. Show, but, uh, but yeah, I, I could see them. That is the next time we'll see them is most likely going to be these three characters and one more person, which we'll talk about in our Easter eggs and notes. Uh, anybody else have anything else about the main movie uh, before we go into Easter eggs and notes? No, I think I've covered most of mine. Yeah, no, nothing really from me. I think it's just it was an interesting wrap. 
Excellent. Shall we go into uh, some Easter eggs and notes then? Um, sure. One thing we didn't mention uh, throughout the movie, uh, and we mentioned there's been a few firsts in this movie, but uh, first sex scene in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, since Netflix. Although it's been implied multiple times with Captain America and Peggy Carter and they're dancing. That's not the same thing, though, Chris. <laughs> it's, it's been implied that Captain America is a vir- has been a virgin up until he meets Peggy Carter and they have a dance back oh, in the 50s. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, this that- is an actual sex scene that's on screen in, in a movie. And I must say, being in the cinema and seeing the the PG standard uh, coming up at the start um, of a Marvel movie, seeing that coming up at the start and then seeing the, the sex scene uh, in here, I was going, well, they probably should have made sure that people were aware that this isn't your standard movie. This will go into more adult themes. I thought it was, I was quite surprised that it did have uh, the kind of sex scene we would have seen in the Netflix shows, for example. Yeah, it's kind of sex scene from the shoulders up, exactly. I guess. Yeah. Um, and he, it's more that um, Icarus chooses uh, mid-sex uh, to say he loves her, which is definitely a choice. Is that like Midgard? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is it's more it's, it's a new like, realm Asgard. it's a new thor realm mid sex yes exactly speaking of mid uh let's go to the mid credit scene then uh since there's nothing else to say about sex scene our mid credit scene pat oswald and his fourth actually his sixth uh marvel universe role after playing four uh brothers on agents of shield um also modok on the tv show modok and now playing uh pip the drunken troll uh, yeah. In the Cinematic Universe. Um, he announces the ri- arrival of uh, Thanos' brother, Eros, played by Harry Styles. Yep. Yes. And we did already say this to Chris, so this is not used to him, but uh, we were completely spoiled about this reveal by a news station we were listening to two and a half weeks before the movie came out, where they had in their entertainment section, guess who's joined the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Harry Styles plays Eros, the brother of Thanos. And it was dealt with in the same way as Look Who's Dating Who in this entertainment story. It was one of those ones where you're going, why are you telling us the mid credit scene for a movie that is coming out in two and a half weeks' time? Why do I need to know this on a standard radio entertainment hour uh, section? I'd rather have waited to see it uh, when it comes up. But quite interesting to see uh, this actor, Harry Styles, in the movie. I know um, he's only really done one big movie before, which was Dunkirk, uh, with Barry Kogan, uh, who plays Droog in this movie. I wonder if uh, if Barry Kogan put in a little word for him uh, with, with <laughs> Chloe Zhao. Uh, he's free. Uh, why can't he come in? Uh, oh, great. Uh, that will definitely get people in for the next, uh, the next movie. But again, really interesting having Harry Styles playing the brother of CGI character Thanos. Yeah. So Thanos is an eternal. That's right. Just getting that out there. Yeah. He's a he's a an eternal with the deviant gene. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, is that or that's how they used to describe him. He he's basically he's a bit off left of center. Yeah. Uh, the, i.e. the purpleness and the 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 chin and all that jazz. And Eros was specifically created to be a an attractive brother of Thanos. That was the yeah. that was the creation. So I kind of like the idea of picking someone like Harry Styles, who's known to be very attractive. Um, but he, yes. he also has a different type of deviant gene, let's say. Uh, he likes um he likes a lot of fun uh, outside <laughs> outside of the uh, standard pursuits, let's say. Uh, so yes, he likes exactly. he likes deviant. He likes being yes. deviant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's an interesting choice because this is what so the film does end with the Eternals will return. And yeah. then we get the credits and we get these two credit scenes. So with then this and the the choice, this is the only thing that I was like, oh, my God, because part of me does wonder if we are going to get more, how much more Eternals we are going to get throughout the films uh, or through the, the next couple. Because as we've, there's a couple of untitled Marvel projects and I'm like, is one of them Eternals 2? Is it the Eternals in space? <laughs> it's like. Eternals in space, <laughs> kind of that type of thing. I can kind of see some of them turning up in, in the next Thor movie, you know, that, or the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie. They're all, they're both in space, so uh, I yes. can kind of see that happening. Um, I don't think you need an Eternals to uh, Eternals as a movie covering the span of six and a half thousand years or seven thousand years. That wouldn't work again. So we wouldn't be able no. to tell another Eternal story. You would have to really ground it and have it over the course yeah. of a week or something. And I don't think that would work for this group of characters it'd be great to see these characters seeded out through around the marvel universe and this being their intro i guess now that harry styles is eros uh given how big he is right now then i suspect we will be getting something where there's a lot of eternals whether it's eternal 2 um (laughs) who knows but it will be um a lot of eternals and i guess other stuff 
well, the great thing about him being about him being Eros, if we are going to get more Eternals, he's with McCary, Droog, and Thena. So, uh, so hopefully that means we're going to see the three of them again in a Marvel movie. <laughs> so this was my thing. I was like, oh, okay, the introduction of Harry Styles does kind of suggest to me that there is going to be something more. And with those three characters and what they're they're, they're potentially going to do, I'm like, oh, okay, this is where you're going to go with it. Like, this is potentially an interesting take and it kind of was like okay well look the Eternals we can't as you said you can't do 6,000 years again of story so what you can do is uh, it's a story in space with Eros with Druig Makari some flashbacks to Druig Makari's relationships throughout the years maybe some of that and then Athena's flashback to some of her previous incarnations of the Mad Weary so that's your flashbacky parts and then it's just centered in them finding more Eternals going to say, because you've got to save the other Eternals. That's what their job is as well. They need to go off and save um, Cersei and the rest of them. So it's going to be interesting. And the fact that I was like, oh, well, this is going to be a bit like, I, I, I think, like, say, like some of the, the cameos of the other Guardians of the Galaxy in Guardians of the Galaxy, where uh, two, where you had Sylvester Stallone and a few others. I was like, all right, it it's a nice it's a nice thing. I think that fact that it's Harry Styles. I think the fact that it's a few of the. I think this is hinting at potentially they will announce something, and I think it may be another four years from. I I I think potentially you're right. It, I think it's a film, but they could do it as Disney Plus show. Um. But I think that's just harder to do because it's more expensive. So I think it will be in Eternals 2. We do have Disney Plus Day coming up soon. Yep, 12th of um, November. Or Disney Day. So there is Star Wars <laughs> announcements and there is Marvel announcements. Um, and in that, there's going to be... Potentially, that's where they will announce a couple more films. Absolutely. It's the day yeah. that uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings is being released on Disney Plus yes. as well. So, um, yes, supposed to be some uh, upcoming announcement for some uh, additional Marvel movies that are that are coming out uh, in the next yeah. few years. Um, yeah. I, I, again, I'm perfectly happy with with Harry Styles being yeah. cast in this role. He's He was really good in Dunkirk in the, in the role that he had in there. I'm, I'm interested to see him uh, in the future. And, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever way it would be. But I, I do feel this was the Eternals are now introduced – off we go now and tell stories with those characters yes, in other exactly. Marvel movies yeah. uh, in different ways. But I can certainly see if you wanted to do an epic Eternals 2, I think what you do is you get, exactly as you say, get them building an army of Eternals versus Arashem to release the three Eternals that he's taken. And that's your that's your big core battle um, yeah. movie yeah. that you could go for if you're doing Eternals 2. Look, we've broken it. Send us, a, send us an email, Marvel. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get the script <laughs> together. I'm sure it'll be grand. <laughs> yes, exactly. And but let's move on to the post, 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 post credits. Well, the post credits. Ebony yes. Blade. <laughs> yes, I love this. I love this one. Um, I just thought it was just so nicely done. Mm. I love the kind of the the flutter around the blade. Um, as the blood curse. Yeah, the blood curse that as as Dane goes goes towards it, uh, and of course, just the intrigue of. Who just said that line to him? Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who, what, what, who's that? Like, we came out of the cinema going, was that Nick Fury? I just don't yeah. know. And then Derek kind of mentioned it could be young Nick Fury or something like that. I was mm-hmm. like, and then it was. I'm thinking like multiversal. Nick yeah. Fury it, multiversal yeah. Character. The reason why Nick Fury, of course, is because that really felt like exactly the line that, um, that, Nick Fury said to Tony Stark when he was introduced exactly. to, the, to the world, and I was just expecting the camera to flip around so we could see the character who was saying, who was saying this, uh, saying this speech or saying this. Or do you really think that's the right choice, uh, Mister Whitmore? It really felt like, wait a minute, why would you end on a black screen? Why would you not pass around to the character that that's there? I must admit, and I know I could I could Google away or I could I could Wikipedia all day. Black Knight is the character I know practically nothing about. I've been reading comics for. 30 years now and i don't think black knight has ever appeared in anything that i've been interested enough to remember the only time i've seen this character is in lego marvel superheroes where i yeah. <laughs> played the character for a while so as far as i'm concerned he is uh, a medieval character who carries a sword um i know yeah. literally nothing about him apart from that but what was annoying was 
I knew that Kit, Kit Harrington was playing Dane Whitmore. I knew A. Whitmore had been the Black Knight uh, from, again, Lego Marvel Superheroes. Um, so I was waiting for <laughs> a team up between the Black Knight and the Eternals for the entirety of the movie. And we get the post credit scene where he looks at the blade and then <laughs> someone says something to him and it goes to black. And I'm like, oh, my God, why has he not got the suit on? <laughs> yep. Um, I thought it was just I thought it was like John Walker, U.S. agent. Uh, and it yeah, was like okay. maybe you would have had Val there beside him or something. Mm. I thought that's why they were going like, this is Dark Avengers. We're getting more and more post credits around that. Right. Um, I do know Black Knight. I know a lot of his history just because I'm a nerd, I suppose. Yeah, I um, know so. He's part of the Avengers and he's a bit more mystical yeah. and things like that. Um, uh, and more, he overlaps on a lot of the kind of multiversal some of the weird multiversal stuff that that's been going on in back in the day Mm -hmm. with Marvel comics. So he was involved in a lot of that. Uh, And then obviously I loved Excalibur, the UK based superhero team, like the Avengers led by Captain Britain. He was a big part of that. Um, So that's where I do know him from the person who it is the voiced. So we, should we just say it to who it is? It is Mahershala Ali. It is Blade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that which is cool. It's amazing. Yeah. I had no idea. I I had to get told that by online. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I did not connect the voice. Did not connect. I am I am very interested to see yeah. where they go. And, and it fits as well. I mean, you think of say, you know, not Blade, but you just, you think of the mythos of the vampire. You know, the castle in in Romania. There is that element of. The medieval, mm-hmm. um, yes. the, the the law to it, and so having the Black Knight connected with Blade in some way um, makes an awful lot of sense. And yeah, I think this is very very cool. Actually, yeah. uh, it, it suddenly made me excited for the Black Knight. Um, and whether and it's just a personal choice whether Kit Harrington is the one for me, I don't know. Uh, but I, that final post credit scene has convinced me uh, of of it all with with the Black Knight um, for sure. I, right. I love the reveal of the sword. I loved it kind of wrapped in the kind of almost like bloody bandages. Um, I I love the little nod actually in the movie. You know, after seeing that post credit scene where she got him that ring the medi certainly yeah. got him the the ring um and well uh, it does there's a couple of little moments it's really it's nice really, so like the fact that she i mean when she knows that the uh planet is going to die when it's effectively the apocalypse is coming she tells dane whitmore to get in contact with his uncle that he's lost contact with and uh and talk to him and resolve mm-hmm. the issues that they've had which is why we have the post credit scenes why whitmore is there with the with the sword he's obviously reconnected with his family and learned this yeah. history uh since yeah. the last time cersei and he spoke so uh so that's the, i suppose because i had that knowledge that he's playing the black knight i was watching um kit harrington the whole time as things are getting revealed to him going when are you going to share your secret that you run yeah. out at night dressed in medieval gear cutting down vampires uh, or doing whatever it is that you do with a sword in London. Um, when are you going to reveal your secret? And it's only at the end that he's found out what the secret is and is about to take that journey at the end of the movie. You, so. you could almost sense that Loki moment where there's the, the reenactment society where, the, I don't know, you could imagine a bigger version of that on the movie where there's some kind of medieval reenactment of a battle that, that, that Dane Whitmore gets sort of embroiled in as mm-hmm. the real Black Knight. I think mean, that'd be hilarious. But um, I, I guess they won't do that. I certainly won't be getting a call from the writers at Marvel. No, I don't don't think any any of us ever will. Uh, Before we go on to some feedback for the Eternals uh, movie and from our wonderful fellow defenders, uh, guys, let's see who defends the movie now that we have finished our full discussion on it. John, how about yourself? Do you defend Marvel's Eternals? Yeah, I do defend this movie. Um, I'd give it four House of Eternal uh, out of five. Um, I think, um, I, I just think it had a really, I think it, probably was always going to be slightly sort of uncertain for anyone of uh, who watches Marvel movies, even on the comic books. I mean, this is, and I think it's got a really tough job to do. It's not really focusing on one person. It's, it's a group um, that are hugely powerful. It is talking about, you know, very theological themes, I guess, to some extent, or philosophical themes around how, 
um you know worlds are created and 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 it coming out of the the death of a planet that these eternals have have come to to love and care for in the most part um it, it's having to say you know connect back into the previous mcu movies and um set up how they're going to be integrated uh into the 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 next phase of the mcu and I think it did it really well. I really love that epic visual style of Chloe Zhao. I loved in mostly the the action sequences that she did. I thought there were some great shots, and um, particularly the one um, in, in the forest. Uh, I really like the dynamics between the Eternals. I think you know, she really captured that quite nicely in the time she had, given everything else that was going on um, here. Uh, the it. it Took a few rugs from under my feet, you know, with the Icarus betrayal. I really liked that, that reveal, um, and how it connected to his disappearance and, and sort of estrangement from Cersei and um, the Druig Makari relationship and um, that, that whole element and that he wasn't the bad guy in, in that sense. Like I was just thinking, uh, all the way through this and, um, I, I really just liked all the different elements of, of this, really. Um, and But I, I think it was a lot to take in. I, I definitely feel I need to see it again. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I came out liking it, but it was like, I need to see it again, to be honest. And I think our discussion here has made me sort of like it a bit more than I probably did coming out of the, the movie, to be honest. But I still think I need to s- sit down and look at this um, a- again, because it, it's massive. It's epic. It, it really is huge. It, it's cramming, I guess, Endgame into one movie, ultimately, um, without any sort of build-up to it, um, with no real central character to speak of yes Cersei um, but an ensemble uh, mix and it's it's the Eternals that are the central character so I, I thought this was done really well and I loved the post credit scene with um the the black knight hint and certainly once sort of figured out who whose voice that was uh, being blade great so yeah I I defend this movie. I I really liked it, and I'd give it four House of Eternal, um, to give a Game of Thrones reference, out of five. Excellent. How about yourself, Chris? How are you feeling about uh, the Eternal? Do you defend Marvel's Eternals? Oh, I do defend it. Um, it, it, As I said, it's good. It's not great. Amazing. Um, It's a... Having talked more about it throughout the discussions, now I am more upbeat on it having discussed it all with you um i think it, it's brought to light a few things i still think there's some choices made that i just personally wouldn't have done. i wouldn't have broken the story like this I, I would have used potentially some of the others um but i i think again i in the mcu i trust like they have a story they want to tell us so i'm going to go their their way and read it their way and watch it their way um they they have choices and I will follow them. Um, I love the actors. I love the the overall some of the the choices and see and I think the rep. I, it sounds like a terrible thing, but the representation is a huge thing for me. Um, just seeing this on screen and not played out as big fanfare just was was fantastic. Absolutely, um, yep. and. Uh, some of just these strange, cho- strange. No, some of the smaller choices, like Barry Keoghan having an Irish accent, mm-hmm. a very Irish accent, <laughs> yeah. having Selma Hayek have that Mexican accent, having uh, Kingo have his kind of Indian accent. Like all these choices were just great, and they're small, but they add to the film. It was epic. It was Marvel. I enjoyed it. Absolutely. All the accents, I must say, it just, it, it kind of struck me after watching the movie. I was like, okay, these are turtles. They're coming to, uh, to our planet 5000 BC and they all have these different accents and they're allowed to use them because it's fine. We don't know what space aliens sound like, but I, I kind of love the idea that potentially, you know, um, we don't know exactly where Salma Hayek's farm is, where Ajax's farm is. Would she possibly have lived in the area near Mexico? And that's why. Uh, Mexican people have a very similar accent to her. Did did Icarus go to Scotland, and that's why Scottish people have a Scottish accent? You know, I was just kind of working yeah. it out that all of these people are from a different planet, 
we're here thousands of years and maybe they, they're the ones that developed the accents that we all have yeah. in different corners of the world because yeah. they all moved to different corners of the world. It's a great, it's a great yeah. little um, Marvel no prize for why they have their accents as they do. <laughs> yeah. There you go. No, it was fun. <laughs> but that's my view. Derek, what about yourself? Do you defend the Eternals? I absolutely do now. Um, must admit, I, I just couldn't form an opinion straight off the bat coming out of the cinema. You know, there's there's times when you know I'm, I'm, I produce the show and I I decide when we record and I I call out to the guys to to make sure we've seen a movie and then go and record as soon as possible. And I'm really glad we didn't record immediately afterwards because I couldn't have formed my thoughts that quickly after this movie. There was so much going on and so much crammed into its runtime, even though the runtime is long, but. I love what they did put in there and I love what they delivered with the film overall and now thinking back on everything and formulating the story as it was presented, which you would usually do after seeing it two or three times, you kind of, you're able to pull together all the pieces. But I think having the podcast and chatting with you guys about it and kind of putting it all together as is has made me appreciate it even more. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it again. I'm really glad we got to see it on a massive big screen because there are some majorly epic moments. There's only just two particular things that I felt watching the movie that I didn't really get when I watched first time. One was it seemed like the editing was allowing a second or two after each actor spoke their lines, which made things feel a little bit disconnected when people were talking to each other. Okay, I yeah. think maybe that we had a bit of a chat about about it before and i think maybe that was because they were trying to create that kind of epic feel of a stage play or of a of a big shakespearean type performance but sometimes it just felt unnatural and it didn't seem to fit with uh big moments like one of richard madden's speeches where he's revealing his beliefs and it felt like everything was just being done on a sound stage with nobody around um so i don't i don't know too much about filmmaking other than the general but it felt like maybe it was just in the editing that things were being allowed to sit for a little bit too long and make them feel disconnected maybe it was just a choice they were like tree beards their their time perception is so different that they have a sentence over um many years maybe maybe that's it (laughs) And then the other thing, and this isn't really a complaint, this is just a bit of a joke. Um, I absolutely have been watching too much Great British Bake Off with John because it felt like <laughs> the powers that all of the Eternals were using was like that gorgeous sugar work they put on top of all the cakes <laughs> and the kind of caramel sugar work that they do. Um, so I was watching that the whole time going, I really want a cake. Um, so <laughs> there you go. But overall, yes, really enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's somewhere in the middle for me. It's definitely above all the comedy Marvel movies. Um, the, your Ant-Man's and your, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy and <laughs> Thor's and all, all those movies. Way, it's way up above there. It's probably closer to the, uh, closer to the top, uh, 15, top 10, uh, Marvel movies. So, uh, that's good after one watch. Uh, I'm looking forward definitely. to seeing it again. I think that's my thing. I will, I, I, as soon as this comes out on Disney Plus, I will be giving it another rewatch in mm. what forty five days. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's going to be going to be coming before Christmas. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I think it's around yeah. the same time as, as Spider Man or the week after Spider Man comes out in cinemas. So, uh, so we'll be able to see it uh, again, just like we'll be seeing Shang Chi next week. Let's get on some feedback from some of our fellow defenders. First up on email to feedback at TV Podcast Industries, we have an email from 084 who says, "I'm having a hard time finding a character or storyline that I didn't care about here." And I'd like to just be happy about this movie that I loved without being too anti-negativity in the community. It's just difficult not to be worried that Marvel and Disney are going to respond to all of the critiques with course correcting that removes things I loved about this first one. Unfortunately, that forces me to care about what other people's opinions on the movie, and that's a difficult spot to be in. All in all, I got to watch a well-crafted, complex story about the beauty of humanity from an outside point of view. I got to see a protagonist who leads this journey not because of her physical abilities, which are also great, but because of her love for humanity. I saw a villain hating himself for betraying people he loved, but unable to waver from his beliefs. I saw a dozen different characters go through beautiful arcs that resonated with the theme of the movie. And yes, there are too many of those arcs to list without writing one of those long-winded emails I used to write to you guys. (laughs) But having a lot of characters not an inherently bad thing in a story. I've seen terrible movies with only a few main characters, and I've seen breathtaking ones with too many to count. What matters is whether it's clear the creators care about what they're presenting to us, and to me, it's clear in spades that Chloe and the other writers care very much. I just hope that they'll be allowed to bring us more. In that regard, I guess I'm at the mercy of the loudest opinions. Until next time, 084. Thanks, 084, for your thoughts. Uh, Really interested to hear that, isn't it? Because for me, you know, you go and watch a movie and you find out what you think about it personally, you know, but this one 
once again, we had that that thing that comes out beforehand, which is this is what the critics are thinking of the movie that you're going to watch next week. Aren't they really negative? This is the worst reviewed movie of all time in, in Marvel history um, from the six reviews that we've got on a Rotten Tomatoes aggregator, which takes no account of what the actual writing was in those reviews. It just takes account of a score and rolls it up into some kind of average uh, as to what it, what it stands for. Um Really difficult with these kinds of movies to go in there and just form your own opinion about what it's yeah. about what you think of it because you're being told you shouldn't like this because this calculation says you shouldn't like it. Well, that's not how I've ever watched movies in my entire life, but you do feel the pressure of it afterwards. Did I like this? Because every everybody apparently didn't like this. Well, that's you know? it, isn't it? It's, it, it's the inherent um, go to now that everything has to be reviewed and i mean i do it you know i do it for that reason of out of five Uh, but in many respects i i guess my out of fives are more of a guide a a personal guide um but it it, it's i i guess that metric just um can can be detrimental or it can be really good i I think uh yeah 084 has encapsulated a lot of what i think about this and and thank you so much for that i think uh, yeah. what you're saying about um icarus you know the villain hating himself for betraying the people that actually he did love but it was his beliefs it mm-hmm. was that that righteousness that 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 that's uh, stuck in the way um and and it's the diversity of different types of story yeah. um that can be done and i i agree i i think chloe uh, Zhao and and the other writers and other uh creators here of, of this story of this production um i think they've done something really really interesting and really really different and marvel movies should have this difference um we expect it in comics and we expect it in in guess the different stories we see anyway and and how they're told um you know it, it really helps sort of bring new ways of looking at things so um yeah thanks yeah. 084 yes thank you 084 um it's interesting i i do think there is an element of the vocal minority here um in that like what we have seen is that uh, as of kind of a saturday um, as reported by Variety and Deadline and stuff, the, the Eternals had already made seventy million um, dollars, um, which is kind of it's the fifth best opening film of the year. Um, Shang Chi was uh, seventy five point three, Venom was ninety million, Marvel's uh, the the Black Widow was eighty, uh, and Fast Saga was seventy. So it still has another twenty four hours. The Sunday to make more and go above because it's Thursday night, Friday, Saturday and Sunday are the the opening box office. Um, And it will basically, it's still one of the biggest. So I think they, I I think there's, I think Marvel are becoming and starting to understand that they don't need to swerve and twist as much as and pander as much as uh, to the audience. And they are very much... If that was the case, we would have got Mephesto like eight times when <laughs> in Disney+. Plus. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but there is always that complaint, isn't there, or that kind of attack on, on a, a studio like Marvel that's getting successful. It's like, why don't you support underground filmmakers or, or, or um, small films? Why don't you put that money that you're earning in the box office into uh, other types of cinema? And really with The Eternals, I think this is an example of where they have. You know, they've backed yeah. a... a, a director who's come from independent cinema who's won an oscar for of course for uh for her movie nomadland but she was brought on board for this movie before an oscar win yeah and she's supported by them and allowed to put her vision into their studio you know they are telling stories that are trying to reach a very wide audience and they have a platform they're being able to do that and because they're reaching out to other filmmakers to put their stamps on marvel movies with the you know with the precursor that there is a kind of a a, a way you have to deal with something that's going to be in the MCU. But I think that's their way of doing it, isn't it? That, that's their way of supporting these um, these other movie makers. Like, I'm, I am certain everybody who's made a Marvel film, if it's been successful and then gone off to make their own movie, has found a member of their audience interested to see what they're doing because they've done other movies in the Marvel Universe. I know the Russo brothers 
have now set up their own studio making movies because of their work in Marvel. It's not because of their work on Community beforehand. It's because of the movies that they made at Marvel and people are willing to check out the movies they've done because of their time spent at Marvel. So it's kind of like they're taking people and giving them the ability to make their own future choices, which will be of interest now um, to, to yeah. uh, future audiences. So I'm glad that they're doing that. And I'm really hopeful. I know it's it's easy to be negative about for when there are, there is a beautiful film like this that's doing things that Marvel that big budget movies let's say haven't done very often in the past. It's easy to be negative that they will take criticism and go right. We're not doing that in the future. But remember what Marvel had done with criticism before. They've actually turned it to their advantage and gone. Actually, we meant to do that in the movie, and we'll and you'll go out and watch Thor: The Dark World five more times because it's essential to watching our biggest movie of all time. They're they're good at taking criticism and turning it into no that's what we meant the whole time so i don't think they're going to change things i don't think they're going to pull it out of the universe this movie exists it's out there and uh, i'm delighted for it yeah 100 percent. thanks oa4 uh we also got some feedback over on facebook uh facebook.com slash group slash tv podcast industry first up we had sandy resendez who said i saw it last night and sad to say i didn't like it i found myself not caring about any of it I think I'm just having a hard time getting on board with the next MCU phases after the climax of Endgames. I almost think this may have been better as a Disney Plus series. I checked my watch a few times and that is telling for me. Thanks, Andy. I've seen a few people say this. Uh, well, both two parts. Both the I'm having difficulty getting into the new MCU phase uh, and uh, other people saying that the Eternals would have been even better as a Disney Plus. On the Disney Plus... I think it's an interesting thought because then you could have had like a six hour epic almost where it could have been completely time spanning where you would have had a whole, yeah, yeah. In, the whole first episode hour would have been the Babylonian and then you would have had different, like you could have seen Cersei and Icarus across the ages in Victorian England in the Renaissance, blah, 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 like all these. And I've seen a few people say that and I think it's an interesting idea and that's where I do like the idea of these larger, when you can, using Disney Plus to tell these longer stories, longer form stories. Mm-hmm. Um, on the difficulty getting onto the MCU next phase, I think just give it time. Not every film is going to be perfect for you and not every film is going to be interesting for you. They're, in, they're having to introduce brand new themes, brand new characters. Uh, and yeah, not every film is going to be what you want, but just wait. Like maybe the next one. Maybe Spider-Man is going to be the next one that really sinks you into this next phase maybe uh the hawkeye series is going to bring you in maybe it's going to be blade maybe it's thor love and thunder wait and see Mm. i certainly would agree with sandy though that the this phase this phase four of marvel feels different to phase one two and three um if you if you look at it from iron man one to end game that's a very definite story and i know iron man fans will say it's the story of tony stark for 24 odd movies that's basically his arc is the whole 24 movies whether he appeared in them or not um and then now we have a new phase introducing new people and it feel it does feel different and it should like yeah. you know i think a lot of a lot of general film fans if you tell them where st- where phase 2 of the marvel universe started and where phase 3 started i don't think they'd be able to tell yeah whereas and- i think now you can yeah um except i will say for Black Widow, yes. which doesn't feel like part of Phase 4. It feels like just because of the day it was released, it's part of Phase 4. Yeah, no, exactly. And it, it, it's more the post-credit that ultimately goes into Phase 4. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, with the MCU phases, you know, MCU have developed and evolved. And I think, you know, between Phases 1 and 2, I, I, think, I think there were different reasons for calling them Phase 1 and Phase 2 and Phase 3. I think with Phase 4, though, it's that... The, the you know the first three phases that was the arc and there were different elements within that um and you know there's a decision isn't it you know if they continued as the previous three phases potentially they might lose people or certainly the reviews will will get worse if it's the same old um it's and and now it's it's getting comfortable with what's going on i mean if after iron man 2 you would have said how that mcu would have developed by by the end of endgame 
I'm not entirely sure I would have thought that given mm. Iron Man 2, um, which I think is you know very early on in the run and um, I didn't much care for it. I mean, I didn't, again, it, it, it's... it's it just wasn't for me. Um, so I, I, I think we're just at that start and we, I guess there's needs to be a, a, a few, a few movies, um, to go. Uh, but mm-hmm. thanks, Sandy. Um, as I think you're right, I think that there'll be very different opinions here on, on, um, I was going to call them the essentials and, uh, no, the, uh, <laughs> eternals. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Sandy. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah. Ron Lefman says, I thought it was fantastic. Some of my favorite character building in the MCU. Interesting. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, thanks, Ron, uh, for for that. Uh, David M. Champagne says, I could never wrap my head around the complexities of the Eternals in the comics. That said, the MCU altered their story enough to make the film beautiful and complex and understandable. I intentionally see the MCU films with a friend who has no comic knowledge. He loved it. Loved Thena and got anguished over the Gilgamesh uh, story arc. He was also curious about Dane, including the post-credit. I had a few issues, mostly from a, a comic perspective. Visually stunning, decent story, and can see the direction it could take into the, the larger MCU. I'd give it a B plus, better than average MCU film. This story hits all the rotten tomato buttons. Cast diversity, all with funny accents. LGBTQ plus acceptance. Strong female characters. No character is white, male, American. Evolution is mentioned and considered fact. Negative rotten tomato scores reflect hatred for woke MCU. The movie pissed off the right people. Um, <laughs> great point, David. Yeah, great point, David. Uh, indeed, yes. I would be more concerned if uh, at this stage in human evolution, to speak like an eternal, uh, that uh, that uh, Rotten Tomatoes score uh, was higher than that. Um, it, it's good to know. Um, I think that the negative zone of uh, Rotten Tomatoes sometimes there's quite a lot uh, about how good... Uh, and challenging the the movie uh, may be in question um for sure and that's interesting about taking um you know a friend along that has no comic knowledge and that's really really important you know we can really get bogged down in the comic law uh, and the comic knowledge uh, as chris always says the burden of knowledge in some cases and you know i i guess these are living stories um and and the, these changes whilst within that framework of the comics and previous ones this is Chloe's work, um, you know, in collaboration with her other writers and with in collaboration with people from Marvel Comics mm-hmm. and Kevin Feige. It, it, collaboration is is the name of the game in this. And so uh, I think it's immensely important that, that stories um, move on uh, and do, you know, yeah. flip the old pancake every so often. So, uh, yeah, great stuff. Thanks, David. Yeah, thanks, David. I know, I know what you mean. Look, they 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 amalgamated the Neil Gaiman run. They took Earth X, stuff from Earth X about the, the the Celestials, which was like Alex Ross and stuff. I bumped up to. We actually had a discussion even before we started recording about some of this. Um, I per- would I would like to see a dreaming Celestial? Yes, I would have. But that is the different, the Golden Celestial, um, and which is the Neil Gaiman run, the Dreaming Celestial, which I, I think would have been an interesting take an arc but it's something different but thank you david sorry it's interesting yeah it is really interesting isn't it, david I, you know given i have read most of the eternals runs i also feel like a brand new uh reader of comic books going into these movies because so many things are different in the movies than they were in the comic books as well so uh I totally get you david thanks very much for your feedback yes thank you david Finally, the last piece of feedback comes from Joe Steinmel, who says, I didn't hate any of the movie, but I didn't love a lot of it. I was drawn in immediately, but beaten down by the runtime, and that's a first in the MCU for me. The voice at the very end was enough to kick my hype levels back up, though. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think all of us who watched Luke Cage uh, and loved Mahershala Ali's performance in there, and uh, spoilers, uh, the character doesn't last past six episodes of that show, uh, 
we were all kind of hoping that work out some way to get him back in the MCU and <laughs> hearing his voice in here in the, in the Eternals is like, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. They have found a way he's coming back uh, in the future. Um, Thanks so much to everybody that's been sending us in the feedback for Eternals. Hopefully you'll have the opportunity to send us in some more feedback in the future to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast at tvpodcastindustries.com where you'll get access to all of our future podcasts. We've got lots coming up over the next couple of uh, couple of weeks, actually. <laughs> next week, we'll be back with our chat about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, which comes out on Disney Plus from the 12th of November. Then on the 19th of November, we'll begin our coverage of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time, uh, a 10-episode series uh, with the first three episodes being released on the 19th of November. Following that, the following week on the 25th of November, we'll be he- back in the MCU here with Hawkeye uh, first two episodes of that show being released on the 25th of November with four more episodes to follow before uh, Christmas. So uh, lots and lots being covered just in the month of November. Uh, Make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get access to all that. Yes. And if you want to support us, head on over to patreon.com slash TV podcast industries because poor Derek's little fingers are going to be clicking a lot and we need to keep him caffeinated. So you can support by going to patreon.com slash TV podcast industries or heading to buymecoffee.com slash TVPI where it keeps him caffeinated or Patreon keeps the hamsters running in the wheel and the servers going because it's a lot of content, you know, that's just four weeks and that's a lot of content. So you should. Should Any you, support. Yes, you should see the dilation of those hamsters' little pupils when you uh, inject them with caffeine. I know, it's <laughs> it, it's so fun to watch. Uh, but thanks so much to all of you who've been supporting us through Patreon or through um, Buy Me A Coffee or through sharing our podcast on, uh, on Twitter and Facebook and uh, wherever you've been sharing it. And, of course to all of those that have been sending us any emails to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com yeah. or go into our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. We love hearing from you uh, and we love all of your support in whatever way you do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. And look forward to speaking to you as early as next week. Indeed. Yes. Thanks so much, fellow defenders, for joining us for our discussion of the Eternals. Remember, keep watching, keep listening and keep defending. Bye. Bye.